Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hazim Amozam and I welcome you all to a, to a seminar on current trends in virology and epidemiology in the context of women's health. It is indeed a matter of delight for us to host our honorable guest, distinguished speakers and participants today. As you're all aware that cervical cancer is caused primarily by human papilloma virus infections and is, is the leading cause of, um, is, the most, is the second most common malignancy in women worldwide and in the OIC member states as well. It remains a leading uh, cause of cancer-related death um, for women in the developing countries. Considering the importance of the subject, CONSTEC has arranged this event, and we will begin today with a recitation from Holy Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء Jazakallah. Now I will request Professor Dr. Uh, Muhammad Iqbal Shodhi, Coordinator General Constec, to share some insights about the event and its significance. Uh, good morning. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, let me greet uh, members of the Dice Party. Professor well, Dr. Thomas Ifna, uh, one of the most prominent researchers in the field of HPV, director of the Medical Virology Institute in Tübingen University and uh, someone who is moving with a mission all around the world. Uh, Dr. Vaseem Jafri, a very dear friend, very renowned health professional, researcher, activist, and a dear friend and supporter of Comstec and our research center in Karachi. Dr. Fazia, thank you very much for coming. She was in uh, Karachi and she has very actively engaged everyone in the wonderful work which she has been doing in the field of HPV and other immunization in the country. We have uh, diplomats from Turkish Embassy, Afghanistan, Excellency the Ambassador. Uh, we have Excellency the Ambassador from Northern Cyprus, Palestine, Turkey, 
Indonesia, and all of you, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us for this very important event. Now, I know that you have to come to uh, Comstock almost every week, but that is for an important cause. Uh, Comstock is a very vibrant organization, one of the most active institutions within the OIC system. Uh, but the objective of this organization is to uh, bring uh, logic into the development endeavor, highlight the key problems in science and technology and health. I would like to thank uh, our colleagues who travel long distances to be with us here. And uh, the mission is to strengthen research on and awareness about HPV and related diseases. I'm pleased to inform you that about 150 participants, including some scientists from OIC member states are, are the part of this international event. Several very distinguished scholars from uh, US, uh, Dr. Patty Gravett from National Institute of Health, Dr. Suzanne Garland from Australia, Dr. Murad from Turkey, and many of the are participating online. And uh, their contributions are extremely important because they work in this field. Now, the theme of this event is uh, largely multidisciplinary. Uh, this is an event which is largely focused on virology, uh, but on HPV to be more specific and HPV infection associated uh, cancers in women. The program is designed to not only deliver an inventory of research, scientific research, but also to provide awareness and sensitization and healthcare workers, opinion makers, and public, uh, general public. As a result, you are from different institutions, and the objective is to help all of us to understand how to better fight the pandemic of uh, HPV. Uh, epidemic of HPV in the country, which is largely underrated uh, and exact data about that is unfortunately not known. You see, according to a recent article in prestigious science journal Lancet Oncology, Pakistan is becoming the hotspot of HPV, human papilloma virus, which is still overlooked as a major risk factor for cervical cancer in over 86 million population. Uh, of 15 years and older. Actual prevalence of HPV infection and related uh, morbidity and mortality remain to be investigated uh, in a systematic manner. Only a few epidemiological studies have been conducted and they were also only non-conclusive and uh, not much of a scientific merit. Among general public, HPV is certainly not known. It is very underrated and undermined. And uh, this is not only in Pakistan, but also in OIC region. 1.9 billion population, mostly in global south uh, and mostly in least developed countries. We face same problems of, uh, unfortunately, a very weak healthcare system, very little research about the major health issues and uh, even uh, less attention of how to improve the healthcare profile and to prevent diseases. As a result of it, uh, HPV is spreading, and I'm sure that uh, experts will tell you how important this problem is to, for us to understand and to improve our knowledge and understanding of uh, HPV and related disorders. YC World face enduring challenges of lots of disease. According to WHO, uh, the disease burden in uh, these developed OIC countries are disproportionately high as compared, to, as compared to other developing countries. And largely this is because of illiteracy, less investment in nutrition and health, uh, very weak health infrastructure, no research, and uh, health is not unfortunately a priority. And as a result of it, you see this immense disease burden of communicable and non-communicable diseases of all kinds. And uh, 
even even if you take the example of Pakistan, I mean, see these uh, statistics, which are just completely mind-boggling. Uh, we have uh, H hepatitis, 7.6%, and Professor Wasim Jaffrey will tell you that we are among the highest, perhaps the highest in the world, in viral diseases. We have epilepsy, disproportionately high level of epilepsy. We have, God knows, uh, extra drug resistance TB, fifth largest in the world. We have uh, about 21% of the high risk population with HIV positive. We have urolithiasis, this kidney stone disease, very high prevalence of diabetes and cardiovascular diseases, all kinds of diseases. Now at the best, what we our leaders are trying to do uh, is to uh, increase the access and in some cases, improve the quality of healthcare system. Very, very, very little research about the causes, underlying reasons of why these very high prevalence. And that is where I think we are lacking. We need to understand that without a good healthcare research, we'll not be able to, uh, to handle and tackle these major challenges of uh, tremendous disease burden which we face today. Among the most prevalent and uh, emerging viral diseases, special threat for population are from pandemics such as COVID-19, viral diseases such, such as Ebola uh, was in, uh, in Ivory Coast and Sierra Leone, Congo is in entire West Africa affecting, even cases are reported in Pakistan also. Dengue, which has never, nobody had, has actually heard of it 30 years ago is now, every year we have a very ferocious, uh, uh, you know, epidemic of dengue. Chikungunya is introduced in some uh, seven, eight years ago. Zika cases uh, remain enduring threat over population. Uh, we are considered to be the exporter of polio in the world. Very unfortunate uh, statistics. And then we have countries like Nigeria, uh, Afghanistan, and Yemen. Very recently, Yemen has reported many cases of polio. Polio, which is eradicated from most of the world, remain a major problem for us. And even uh, dispensing polio vaccine is an, is, is an issue because so much of a misconception which go violent and a lot of serious issues of, of uh, unfortunate killing of health workers. So we face this ferocious epidemics one after the other of these diseases. And we all understand that three fourths of these, these diseases are of viral nature. Vasa Ifna will tell you his prediction about new pandemics which are coming forth and we need to prepare for it. This is exactly what this uh, workshop is all about. To understand and appreciate the fact that uh, these diseases are here to stay. We need to prepare our healthcare system. We need to develop research infrastructure. We need to understand the causes and develop a system which can prevent the spread. And of course, a very good mechanism of disease surveillance, epidemiological levels. According to CESRIC, this proportionally high number of uh, women are affected from cancers, including cervical cancer. We need to understand that without eradicating HPV through various means, which Dr. Fozia is going to tell you, uh, we will not be able to handle the problem of growing number of HPV related uh, cancers. Now, I would not really go on for a lot of these things because many qualified experts will tell you about all these topics. I'll just introduce you to Comstat. Comstat being the only, only intergovernment organization which is chaired by Pakistan is uh, a very important component of Pakistan science initiative. And that showcase the excellence of Pakistan with the objective of developing a science and technology cooperation within the Muslim country. We have a massive Health Africa program in the uh, last uh, one and a half years, we have been in Niger, we were in Unigo, uh, Uganda, we were in Egypt, we are going to go to Chad, uh, we developed a program with Gambia, we trained many people in Gambia, 
and many more. So our emphasis is on Africa, not only improving their healthcare system by providing uh, training, but also to on the field providing treatment of diseases such as neurological and ophthalmological disorders. We have a Science in Exile program, which is with UNESCO. This is a very unique program for scientists, researchers, and students who are displaced because of uh, conflict in these countries. And that is a very important program because it provides us opportunity to help them. So they remain very productive and go back to their countries and, and help rebuilding of their nations through the skill set which they acquire. We have a very large research fellowship program, perhaps the largest in the OIC system. Uh, we have research fellowship for women, and we have uh, research, uh, fellowships and scholarship for, uh, for scholars from occupied, occupied areas uh, like Palestine. There, there is a technician training program. There is a bilateral program with Palestine, Yemen, Nigeria, Sudan, and Somalia. And we wish to develop a similar program with our brothers in Afghanistan. Let me thank you for your presence here. Uh, I know that sparing time in the morning is not so easy, but certainly your presence gave us lots of strength. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, now I would request uh, our honorable speaker, Dr. Fozia Asad, who is the country director of Jamaica, Pakistan, for her remarks. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and very good morning to all of you. Uh, on behalf of Jepaigo, which is an affiliate of Johns Hopkins University, and myself, I just want to extend uh, extreme uh, gratitude and congratulations to Professor Dr. Iqbal Chaudhry and Comstech Secretariat team organizing committee for coming up with this very impressive event of uh, Viral, virology and epidemiology seminar with a special focus on women's health. So when it comes to uh, women's health, the important thing is that there are uh, cancers which need our uh, attention in this evolving virological world. And especially in an uh, era where we are seeing uh, lots of epidemics and pandemics worldwide. So one virus with major impact on women's health, uh, the human papilloma virus, which causes cervical cancer uh, and other cancers uh, with cervical cancer uh, is one of the top four causes of cancer uh, deaths among women. Over 600 cases of uh, cervical cancer globally, uh, we are seeing each year and which are caused by this human papilloma virus. We have had a vaccine against this HPV, human papilloma virus in action for over three decades. And we know that it is very, very effective. Uh, if you see the data from countries like Australia and other countries, they show that it stops the spread of HPV infection very efficiently and effectively. Uh, some of the data from Scandinavian countries like Sweden shows that a direct impact on preventing cancer um, is, is equally good, which is about like they have seen a 90% drop in cervical cancer cases if girls were vaccinated before the age of 17 years. These data showed that true elimination of this uh, surge of women's health is truly possible. Now, understanding the impact of vaccination on interrupting transmission of the human papilloma virus requires a long-term application of epidemiology. Showing this impact requires a 30 years follow-up, but if we take this long view, then we see that the HPV vaccine is in the top five of all the vaccines globally in terms of the number of lives that it can save. Uh, this work is advancing in women's health and survival is a core passion uh, for the development partners and agencies like Japaigo, 
uh, like CHIC, which is a correlation to strengthen the HPV vaccination um, uh, immunization community. Gavi, which is a donor uh, agency, uh, Gavi Alliance, uh, which works uh, in the provision and introductions of vaccine to prevent the preventable diseases globally. And equally is at the heart of the WHO's call to eliminate uh, cervical cancer as a public health problem. So uh, being a signatory of uh, WHO uh, uh, commitment of that each country will eliminate cervical cancer by 2030 by using 90, 70, 90 formula. 90% 90 of the girls between the age of 19 to 14 years need to be vaccinated by 2030. 70% of the women should be screened for this preventable disease of cervical cancer. And out of those 70%, 90% would be provided with treatment to cure this treatable disease of cervical cancer. In case of Pakistan, we have seen that screening and the, even the data is very patchy. It's not so much significant where we can say this is the much is the prevalence rate of cervical cancer in Pakistan. Unfortunately, we don't have any central registry system for women's cancer or specifically to cervical cancer. So I think as a nation, as public health personnel, as doctors, as paramedics, as academia, as policy makers, as journalists, it's all our joint uh, requirement and it's, it's a joint call to come up with some strategy at the national level to combat against this uh, cervical cancer uh, thing in, for the country and contribute into the elimination of the cervical cancer uh, effectively and efficiently. Uh, there is a technical session on HPV uh, roadmap, uh, which has been created with the support of the National Ministry of Health, EPI program, Gavi Alliance. Uh, so uh, definitely that is going to help you uh, providing more insightful information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam. Um, and now I would request Professor Dr. Sayed Basim Jafri, who is who is the full professor of medicine at Aga Khan University, Karachi, for his remarks. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and a privilege to be addressing you this morning on something which is very, very important globally and certainly has got its huge impact in Pakistan. And efforts such as this conference and maybe many, many more conferences throughout the country and the various academic units would bring in the focus that we are going to discuss throughout the day today. Special thanks to Professor Iqbal Chaudhary for thinking about those aspects of life, which if not handled today, tomorrow and day after, would have catastrophic events. And this concept itself needs really, uh, you know, a huge applaud for this wonderful person who thinks about today and future. So that is how this Comstech and under his dynamic leadership is progressing currently, not only on this particular topic, but on several other topics throughout the year. And I wish that others within the country join hands with him so that the focus on current aspects of human life and how they are adversely being affected are going to be handled for foreseeable future. Viral diseases is a global, global problem. And the recent epidemic 
of COVID-19 has sensitized the human world globally. The whole world almost became stationary when it came to you know, travel and whatever else one does normally with social life. I think the cell phone that we all carry in our pockets can be a great source of asking whether or not have you had this test done, whether or not you know, you've had the vaccination and this was happening during COVID and why not for human papilloma virus? As soon as you call somebody, in fact, you keep on hearing that, you know, with the recent floods and whatnot, and you have to hear all that thing for, you know, any length of time. But the same messages and the Ministry of Health has to become sensitized for all this aspects, which really is so important for the human world and the world that we live in currently. So I don't have to say much about it, but I would certainly like, in fact, CONSTAT to be, in fact, you know, for its excellent work that it's currently doing, I would like to congratulate them. And hopefully this event and many, many more events during this year and the following year on this topic and several other topics would sensitize the people, the healthcare providers and others to really come together unless we come together, in fact, the efforts would not pay their dividends as they should pay for viral diseases. And virus is one such living being, which is most democratic. It would affect the highest person in the world, the richest, the poorest, the presidents, the you know, common man sleeping on the street. It has no boundaries whatsoever. It doesn't need a visa or a passport to travel from one country to the other. So this is how the virus is a global, global and it travels beyond, in fact, the financial state. The worst that happened to COVID, look at what happened. The most industrialized countries of the world suffered the most. In fact, when it comes to the number of people that got affected, the number of deaths that happened due to COVID, which country really suffered hugely, the top of the world, the United States of America, in fact, for everything that you know about COVID and the rest of the world as well. So once again, I would like to thank Tom Statch, Professor Chaudhary and his colleagues and the Secretariat itself for organizing this symposium and hopefully it would come out with some very, very positive results as we end by the end of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, regretfully, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Iqbal had to leave for an urgent high-level meeting. Nonetheless, we will continue with our program. Uh, now I would request our distinguished speaker, Professor Dr. Thomas Sitner, who is the director of the Institute of Medical Virology and Epidemiology, of Viral Diseases, University of Tobingen, Germany, for his remarks. So, good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, dear members of the diplomatic corps. Uh, while everything has already been said, I would like to add uh, and share something with you. When I, when I was traveling here, I could see at the airport advertisements about breast cancer to raise awareness of the women about cancer and how it develops and how it can be early detected. But I did not see anything about cervical cancer. And actually when we had the conference last week in Karachi, we had outreach programs with laymen, but, uh, and the laymen had never ever heard about cervical cancer and linked papillomaviruses. And even scientists did not know. And please spread the word that actually cervical cancer is much easier to detect early because you, get, you can look at the cervix, you know, visually with your eye or with some magnification source and, and some light, you can easily take a sample. It's not like breast cancer where it's difficult to take samples and actually to, to find the right place to get the biopsy. So it's much easier. And the other thing is, I mean, breast cancer is not a single form of cancer. There are different forms of cancer, but cervical cancer is actually only developing 99.7% of all cancers worldwide are positive for the DNA of the papillomavirus, of certain papillomaviruses, meaning 
this is a necessary risk for factor for the development of cervical cancer. And if you take out the risk factor, you will have almost no cervical cancer. And we now have the chance even to prevent cancer by vaccination, as Dr. Faustia said, where we have at the moment 600,000 cases worldwide of cervical cancer. So you can prevent by, by vaccinating young girls against the virus, against uh, an infection with uh, viruses. And actually in the non-avalent vaccine nowadays, we have seven types that are so-called high-risk types, which are responsible for 92% of all cervical cancer. So by vaccinating young girls, you can actually preserve the fertility of your daughters, of your wives, and this is gonna help, I mean, to make it a better place, actually. So thank you that uh, I was invited to be here uh, and uh, thanks for attending this conference. And I wish you a stimulating uh, conference afterwards and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rifner. And ladies and gentlemen, you are all requested to join uh, uh, for the group photo outside. Our staff will guide you. This group photo will be followed by high tea arranged outside this auditorium. And we will begin our first technical session here in this auditorium at 11, 15 a.m. Thank you very much. Bismillah rahman rahim uh, Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so we're beginning with the first session, technical session of our event. The, the very first speaker is our, uh, for the keynote lecture um, is Professor Dr. Thomas Sifner. To introduce him, Professor Dr. Thomas Sifner is the Director, Institute of Medical Virology and Epidemiology of Viral Diseases, University of Tübingen, Germany. His research interest in, in the field of papilloma Viruses range from basic research and animal models to clinical studies and molecular epidemiology. He has over 190 specialist publications in the peer-reviewed journals and 250 in the web of science. The title of his talk today is Implementation of HPV Testing as a Primary Scre Screening Modality to Prevent Cervical Cancer in Pakistan. With this, I request Professor Dr. Thomas Sifner for his lecture. So thank you again uh, for being here. Uh, while I was preparing this talk, uh, I was looking at some figures for Pakistan, actually, if I couldn't find out some data telling us what's going on. And I have to tell you, it's really data are scarce, you know? And this is actually taken from the cancer registry of Punjab, uh, not representative for the whole country. And it's showing us when you look at the incidence, meaning the yearly new cervical cancer rate per 100,000 in Asia, you can see that, oh, okay, here, you can see that Indonesia is really on the top and Pakistan is doing quite good uh, with five point something per 100,000. However, when you look at the mortality, uh, what you can see is actually that Pakistan is going up uh, in the ranking, meaning either the cancers are detected too late or the follow-up and the respective treatment is not good enough. If, if you compare this, for example, to uh, Republic of Korea, you can see incidence rate is higher, but the mortality rate is by far lower, meaning they're doing a better job in detecting these cancers or following them up. Okay, very important. Uh, HPV DNA has been detected worldwide in 99.7% percent of all cervical cancers, meaning, and this has been shown by multi, multiple studies, that a persistent infection, and this is very important, the persistent infection, 
uh, with certain so-called high-risk types, we come to this in a minute, is a necessary risk factor for the development of cervical cancer. And if you take out this necessary risk factor, you will have almost no cases of cervical cancer. And this is a clear justification for the vaccination to take out the risk factor and prevent infection, and also for HPV testing to, to uh, find early stages of the disease. And very important, the persistent infection, because usually the infection clears spontaneously and there is no nothing happening afterwards. So what are papillomaviruses? Very quickly going through this slide. These are small viruses with, uh, they don't have a lipid envelope. Diameter is about 55 nanometers. Within the capsids, they have a double-stranded circular DNA of about 8,000 base pairs. We have about 200 and more than 200 types affecting humans, actually. And papillomaviruses are, you can find them all over all mammalian species, actually. But they are very strictly species-specific. So you will not find a human papillomavirus, for example, that infects mice or a mouse papillomavirus that infects humans. So it's strictly species-specific, very important. It replicates locally, it does not make a systemic infection, and it replicates in the differentiated epithelium because it needs a differentiation of the cells to produce new viruses. So it's completely adapted to all these processes within the epithelium. Uh, and because they do these local infections, they do not cause a striking immune response. Actually, they are very good in hiding uh, uh, of the immune system. That means you can even find uh, individuals that have been infected and they do not have any uh, antibody uh, response so far. So the natural infection actually leaves women very often uh, not protected and they can be reinfected again. Now, what do papillomaviruses do to the epithelium? You, you see here uh, histopathology uh, of different lesions, and, uh, and these lesions are called cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. What you can see here is a normal healthy cervix, as a corposcopist would see it, looking directly at the ectocervix here, and here is inside the endocervix, going up the endocervical canal to the uterus. So this is a healthy cervix, and if you now have an infection, usually you don't see anything. Because, as I said, most infections are transient, go by, and it's like a cold, common cold of the cervix, nothing else. However, in a certain fraction, there might be lesions developing, and you can actually divide those uh, CIN abbreviated into two different entities, into CIN1. You can see here after acetic acid staining, there is a lesion visible actually, white acetoacetic staining. And when you look at the histopathology, you see the epithelium looks almost completely normal. Only in the suprabasal cell layers, you see also cells can, can divide, which is unusual because normally only the lowest layer of the epithelium has proliferating cells. Meaning we have a full ongoing differentiation process in, the, in this lesion called CIN1, and that means it supports productive infection. New viruses are produced from this CIN1. However, when we come to CIN2, where up to two thirds of the epithelium are built up by abnormal cells, or so CIN3, where the full thickness is actually built up by these abnormal cells, there is no differentiation anymore. There is no production of viruses anymore, and we have an abortive infection. And when you know something about virology, Whenever it comes to an abortive infection, something is wrong. Because first of all, for the virus, this is, this is a dead end because no virus particles can be produced. It got stuck somewhere, it cannot escape. And the continuous action of the viral oncogene C6 and C7 then may lead to actually further progression into invasive carcinoma. Very importantly, this process from healthy cervix infection up to carcinoma may take up to 10 to 15 years. And you have a lot of possibilities that those lesions spontaneously regress. Very often seen in CIN1, we see actually in Germany 50% of, of the CIN2 that also spontaneously regress. So we observe them only in the US because of legal issues, they remove them. But tell you, it's safe to observe them. Uh, and then you have CIN3, and you can see here, this is already a precancer. There is still a possibility of a regression of CIN3. We, ha we have observed that in single cases, in few cases. However, when you, when you cross uh, the border to invasive carcinoma, there is no way back. Uh, if carcinoma develops, it's there, and you have to do something about it. Better you do it before. Now, 
uh, in the Western countries, uh, uh, there has been used the pap smear as cervical cancer screening tool to detect precursor lesions. So not the infection, not the risk factor, but after something has already happened. And this is a technique that has been developed by a, by a Greek uh, pathologist, Papa Nicolaou, actually 100 years ago. Can you imagine that 100 years ago? Are you driving with a car on your streets 100 years old? Probably not, yes. Uh, so uh, what you do there is you take cells from the ectocervix and from the endocervix using such a cytobrush. You put the cells on glass slides, you fix them, you send them to the cytologist, he stains it, and then he looks through the microscope and if he's seeing something like that, it's clear to him, large nuclei, less cytoplasm, this is a high grade lesion, this is a CIN3. Would be great if it would really work, but all studies and meta-analysis have shown the sensitivity of pap smear for detecting a CIN3 is not higher than 50 to 60%, meaning you can actually flip a coin to have a result. So that was the reason why actually during the course of the life in the Western countries, there were yearly pap smears. Like in Germany, pap smear starting at the age of 20 with an infinite uh, end. And this was because they knew that they could miss during one visit a, a high-grade lesion, but they to, to, to find it actually, they had yearly lesions because it takes some time, as I told you, to develop the precancer. Now, when you look now at the age-specific um, prevalence, you see this is from Western countries that soon after uh, beginning of sexual activity, the prevalence uh, rises of HPV in the, in, the, in the females and it reaches a peak at the age of 20 to 25, which is different in, in each country. In Germany, it's about 22%. In Denmark, it's even 28%. Uh, it's not known how it is here in Pakistan, more or less. And then you see you have a spontaneous clearance. Uh, so women get rid of the infection. And then we have, after the age of 30, we have a steady curve, meaning we have here a balance of women that become reinfected and of women that were not able to clear the infection, meaning they develop a persistent uh, infection. And the persistent infection is actually the risky one. This is a major risk factor for the development of precancer. And if this is not, a, uh, and this is precancer, which has a, uh, a peak here in the Western countries around 30 to 35, uh, but most of it is actually detected. So you have very late than the peak of the cancer. When you look in Africa, this curve, the green curve goes steadily up. So you have here a peak of cancer at 60, and this is because there is no screening. Uh, Precancers are not detected and they uh, progress. Now, ha having seen this and knowing about the risk factor, uh, another approach would be, as I always have said, to vaccinate young girls before they uh, start sexual activity and thereby uh, protect them against an infection. And then to have at least two smears in the lifetime. And the WHO proposes it's at the age of 35 and 45. Now, how can you detect HPV? Uh, as I said, this is a virus containing double-stranded DNA, so you can do a DNA test detecting the DNA. However, if the DNA needs to be replicated in the cell, uh, it needs to express messenger RNA and from this are viral proteins because there are two proteins of the virus involved in replication, meaning an active infection always has DNA and RNA present. And RNA by itself only shows an active infection, whereas DNA can be also detected with a DNA test uh, when it, it detects only viral particles or dead cells that still contain uh, viral DNA. So, at, so this was a starting point in 2000 uh, when we uh, were thinking about why not replacing pap smear with HPV testing directly. Because at that time, the screening was with cytology, as I told you, uh, diagnosis was done through colposcopy directed biopsies, and then the pathologist gave a diagnosis, and this was a decision how to go on, and the confirm of cure was actually done uh, by cytology. Now, at that time, we said, okay, because we know that the absence of high-risk HPV actually increases all steps of prevention, we can actually change from screening from precursor lesions where already something has happened to the epithelium to look for the necessary risk factor. And this it gives us a possibility that if women that don't have this risk factor to put them on extended screening intervals, and actually you should not, and you have to extend the screening intervals because I told you, uh, the spontaneous clearance is, very, is, is highly frequent of the infection, but it takes time because the immune system is not alert of the infection. So it takes time up to two years. So having screening intervals, including HPV testing, 
actually demands to have at least two years uh, apart between two screen grounds or even three to five years. And for this clearly at the time, long-term follow-up was needed. And this is why uh, we get funding from the EC and I coordinate this project from seven different countries. We took already established uh, cohorts in total uh, 25,000 women and we followed them with pap smear and in parallel we did an HPV test an HPV test to detect those high risk type viruses uh, that uh, uh, can cause cervical cancer up to certain times without differentiating in between uh, those tests. And I show you only one slide and this is actually uh, the uh, cumulative incidence rate of CIN3 per per 10,000 women over time, 72 months. And you can see women that were at baseline when they entered the study had a normal cytology developed over time, linear increase of CIN3. So meaning negative cytology or normal cytology was not predictive at all uh, for the future. However, when the women were negative by the group test for high-risk papillomavirus, you can see the curve is much more flat. And if there were normal cytology and negative, the difference is marginal. And this was actually the initial spark for randomized control trials in Europe uh, to, to start it because already after two years, we had quite promising results. And that happened afterwards. And what they did here, this is now uh, a paper that summarizes actually 177,000 women with an endpoint now of cervical cancer. Uh, and this was done in, uh, by randomized control trials by combining the trials from Sweden, Netherlands, Italy, and UK. And again, you see the cumulative incidence rate of cervical cancer, invasive cervical cancer. And the red curve shows you women that were uh, negative, uh, that had normal cytology at baseline. Again, they develop after, after three years or two to three years, they develop uh, uh, increasing uh, linear increase of uh, cervical cancer. And whereas the curve for uh, women that were at the in initial test HPV negative is flat again. Now, what types are now classified as those high-risk types? Uh, already 1995, two types, namely 16 and 18, were classified as group one by the International Agency for Research Against Cancer, the IARC, which belongs to the WHO. And actually, even in the first publication from the group of Zuhausen, who actually got the Nobel Prize for, uh, uh, for detecting this causal, causal relationship between infection uh, with HPV-16, uh, and cervical cancer, it, the data are still true. He found 50% of cervical cancers at that time uh, contained the DNA of HPV-16. And this is today uh, fully true. And in the meantime, WHO classified other types, uh, in total other uh, um, 11 types as uh, group one or group two A carcinogenic. Those types are the so-called high-risk types in comparison, for example, to the so-called low-risk types like six and 11, which can cause genital warts. Very important, if you do HPV testing, uh, you do a screening on healthy women. And wherever a test is positive or screening positive, you have follow-up procedures. So it's very important that you are not going for maximum sensitivity of a test. So you have to balance, actually, the, the threshold where the test is positive, that you gain good sensitivity, but also a good specificity. And I come to that in the next slide, meaning, actually, your test should not detect uh, less than 1,000 to 10,000 copies of viral DNA within the sample. Otherwise, you're picking up latent infections, clinically irrelevant. You, you send the women for unnecessary follow-up that also causes costs, that causes harm, is a psychological stress. And now, because I also talked about specificity, just an example, if you have 1,000 women, 100 women of those 1,000 have an CIN3, 900 are normal and if you screen them with a test and you see in the group of CIN3 the 100 one that 81 uh, are positive and 20 are negative it's easy the sensitivity of the test is 80 percent okay fine but on the other hand when you when you now test the 900 and you come up with 100 positives that have no CIN3 that is false positive and that gives you actually a specificity of 89%, which is not, which, which you can never ever use in a skinning program because it's in by far too many uh, healthy women to unnecessary follow up. So, specificity is very important, also, not only sensitivity. And this is the reason why two expert groups have long time ago already um, given some guidelines. So, uh, they use the hybrid capture test 
uh, which is a gold standard used in all these randomized control trials so far and have been proven to work very well. And whenever you uh, a new test enters the market, it has to have relative sensitivity or uh, with regard to hybrid capture of 90%, specificity of 89%. And this has to be done in a representative number of samples, including a number of CIN2 plus cases uh, in a routine screening population. Okay, with having said that, I will show you some data when we compared uh, a few DNA tests with each other and DNA versus RNA, just to show you uh, uh, what the outcome is. And this was a monitoring study, 13,000 women. Uh, we collected uh, the leftover of liquid cytology samples and we tested all uh, cytology positives and a randomized number of uh, cytology negative samples. And we included uh, 60 CIN3 plus cases. And we used this, uh, we, we did the, the gold standard and the DNA test from Hologix, Arista, and the Abbott high HPV high risk test, which is a PCR based test uh, for the DNA. And as you can see here, comparison of the Arista with the hybrid capture shows quite good concordance. However, in those women that has have a normal cytology, we see a higher uh, positivity rate with the Cervista in comparison to the hybrid capture, uh, telling us there might be some false positives. When we now do the same for the Abbott, we can see in the women with the normal cytology, both tests are highly concordant. However, in those women that have uh, CIN3, for example, or uh, um, high ASCUS, we can see uh, that the airport test performs less well. And in fact, actually in this study, uh, this test missed uh, a few cases of CIN3. And then we now combine this data together, sensitivity and specificity in a table, uh, we chose in the x-axis 100% from 0 to 100% sensitivity here, and one minus specificity at the y-axis. You can see the ideal test would be here, 100, 100, yes. And you can see when we now plot the sensitivities and specificities of these tests, this is a gold standard. Airbot is about having the same specificity, not reaching the sensitivity, but uh, confidence intervals are overlapping. However, the Arista test has a by far lower uh, specificity. And this is because it picks up, uh, it, it gives uh, a quite um, a high number of positive women in the women that have a uh, normal cytology smear. And this should not happen. Actually, uh, this test has been FDA approved. So you cannot even rely on the FDA approval. You really have to, to check out uh, those tests and compare them. Now I'm coming to a comparison, now a much more controlled study where we compared the Optima RNA test with the gold standard. And this was done by taking uh, liquid cytology samples from women with, in one vial. Cytology was done out of the sample. Uh, the, the, both, the, uh, both HPV tests have been done. And in case of positive results, also the genotyping was performed. And this was a routine screening population of women aged 30 to 60, a multicenter study in Germany. These are the exclusion criteria. And we also wanted uh, to, uh, so first of all, all positive women in any test were within eight weeks uh, uh, sent to colposcopy, but we aimed also to send a control group of 5% of women that were negative in all, in all tests to colposcopy. And very importantly now, uh, we now have here also a follow-up of up to six years where we followed all those women uh, that were not, that had not, uh, no therapy and were positive in one of those tests uh, to see what the outcome is. And this is, you don't, you don't have to read this, just showing you 10,000 women were done. Most of them were actually negative in all tests. Still, they attended colposcopy and we had a biopsy rate of 28%. And in all the other uh, groups, we had a quite good colposcopy attendance and also a high uh, biopsy rate. Now showing you, when you look at the cross-sectional comparison, Comparing the RNA test and the DNA test, you see sensitivity is, uh, is, is, is the same. It's not significant different. However, specificity is higher for the RNA test. And this is because it picks up actually only active infections. And also, uh, and, that, and, the, and that difference might look to you small, but only 1.2%, you know, difference in specificity can actually cause um, less uh, follow-up rates of, uh, of 23%, meaning if you have to send 23% fewer women to follow up, this is more cost efficient, it causes less harm to the women, and still you have the same sensitivity, meaning the safety is there. Now, we followed up these women, as I said, 
And we aimed to uh, have also a follow-up on the triple negative cohort after five to six years. And then on all these women that were either cytology pos negative for HPV positive, vice versa, or positive in HPV test and cytology with yearly visits. And when they were not treated, they were followed up up to six years. And I'll show you just the, the raw data here out of that. So out of the um, triple negative women, we invited 4,000, 3,295 uh, uh, participated, and we found only four CIN3 in this large group after six years, after the initial test uh, uh, that was triple negative. So both HPV tests and cytology. Now coming to the other groups, uh, the double positive group, HPV test positive and, uh, and uh, a, a cytology positive at baseline, we can see that six CINs we showed up in the group. Very importantly, in the group that was at baseline cytology positive, but HPV negative, we had not a single case of CIN2 or higher. And in the, and in the group that was vice versa cytology normal, but HPV positive at baseline, we had the highest number of CIN3. And you can put that up all together uh, in a graph showing you the cumulative incidence rate of CIN3 over time from zero to six years. And you see the curve uh, for women with negative cytology is by far higher, coming to a risk of 9.3 per thousand women screened, having an initial negative cytology result after six years. Whereas you cannot see really a good uh, difference between the RNA and the DNA test, meaning they have a very high negative predictive value and give you good, pro, uh, a good uh, uh, pr protection of the women that no uh, um, cancers will develop within two or uh, screening intervals, even if they are five years apart. Now, this is even topped by a study from Canada where they did a follow up for, uh, for over 10 years uh, and they compared here. Again, the hybrid capture is a gold standard now versus the Roche test, the COBAS 4800 and the RNA test. And, um, and you can see, uh, just to uh, summarize, they had fewer women uh, testing positive uh, with the RNA HPV test than with the COBAS test. Again, showing a higher specificity, but the long-term risk for CN2 plus and 3 is very comparable either if you use DNA or RNA. And this is just shown here quickly by the cumulative incidence. In the first four years, uh, women that were initially HPV negative were not screened at all. But after four years, screening started, and you can see both DNA tests uh, behave very similar. The DNA tests versus RNA tests uh, behave very similar, meaning good protection even after 10 years. Very important for low and middle income countries are um, and I will come to that also in the next slide. Uh, you can also, the cervical smears do not have to be taken by the doctor or by the midwife. So women can take the smears by themselves after having um, some instruction, which is quite easy actually. So this is called self-sampling. And this is a randomized control trial from Sweden where they included 29,000 women in two arms where the women did vaginal self-sampling or the midwife performed the sampling. And the outcome is actually in both groups, they found the same rate of high cell lesions, CIN2 and CIN3, meaning self-sampling is absolutely safe and is as good as taken as smears taken by the doctors. Now I would like to show you some data from Tanzania where we also uh, perform studies uh, since a while. And this is a combined analysis uh, combining uh, two cohorts uh, um, in total uh, uh, 7,700 women. And those women were now from urban areas and from rural areas. Urban areas were Dar es Salaam, but rural areas Kilimanjaro and other, other provinces actually. Uh, and so women, uh, what we did there, uh, uh, usually in those countries, a uh, very uh, technique you very often see is called VIA, means, means visual inspection of the cervix after application of acetic acid. So you can use any acid, uh, acid, uh, acetic acid, sorry, you use for cooking, you know, uh, you apply it to the cervix and then with a torch or other light source, you look at the cervix and you see if there's a lesion. However, this technique has been shown is not very sensitive even if we have trained all examiners very thoroughly, but the sensitivity, you know, depending on the ex examiner was very different. And actually in the meantime, this has been disregarded. So what we did, we tested nine different scenarios 
And uh, one is just uh, HPV testing. And if positive, immediate treatment, either with thermal ablation or cry cryotherapy, thermal ablation is much easier. It's a portable device. You can go out to the villages. You can do HPV testing. I'll show you in a second how. And you can treat them immediately. Or you screen, then you triage with a follow-up test. So for example, with VIA or you do genotyping and then you treat if positive, if both tests are positive. And the outcome again, is the same uh, graph as I showed you before, sensitivity on the X axis, uh, one minus specificity on the Y axis. And now you can see because in Tanzania, we have quite a lot of women that are H HIV positive. That makes really a difference. Uh, so if you are HIV positive, the HPV prevalence in the group is twice as high, up to 2.5 actually uh, as high, and the progression rate is, is much faster. And if you now look, just do HPV testing uh, with a recommended cutoff, gives you a decent uh, sensitivity and a good specificity that can be in the HIV negative women, that can be increased a little bit by uh, raising the cutoff level. Uh, this is on the cost of uh, sensitivity. However, when you look at the women living with HIV, you see the specificity here is really lousy, not good enough actually. And even if you do extended genotyping, it doesn't help. And this is actually if you triage with VIA. And I don't have to say anything. I mean, this is uh, by far too low uh, that it can be recommended uh, uh, for screening. So how to do HPV testing in those rural areas? And this is just an example I show you here. This is a care HPV test from Kyogen. This is a portable device uh, that you can actually bring out and I, that needs no running water, no electricity, no main electricity, no fridge. Uh, uh, it's very simple to use and it's fast enough to collect samples and run the tests in one day and afterwards do already the treatment. Uh, so very easy and that can be a fun and that could be mentioned for Pakistan, for example, if you have test buses running around the country uh, visiting those villages and uh, do the testing and, and do the treatment. So coming to the end, uh, what are the barriers for the implementation of HPV testing? Uh, uh, these are individual factors like, like having a low awareness about HPV. Do they, people do not know about this link between an infection with a virus and the development of cervical cancer cultural issues, poor screening uptake. So we had, for example, this is not screening, but this is vaccination. At the discussion in Karachi, we had uh, some arguments that the vaccination causes infertility, uh, which is a fairy tale. Uh, but we have to overcome uh, things like that and talk to the people or compromise follow-up. If you don't have a good follow-up or if you don't have a good treatment after screening, don't do screening. It's, it's worthless, you know? Why, why screen if you can't do something afterwards? So you need to have screening in place, you need to have follow-up in place, management of follow-up and also treatment. So the, on the other side, on the provider side, facility side, if people are not trained good enough or if the resources are not good or, on, or if not uh, uh, therapeutic options are available and systemic, if the access to healthcare is difficult, if there is no insurance, and if there are no surveillance and tracking system in place or immigration status is also something. So let me summarize. So clearly high-risk HPV screening is superior to pap screen uh, for cervical cancer screen. That is absolutely clear. HPV tests should be designed to have a clinical cutoff for positivity and should not aim for highest sensitivity to have a high specificity only to detect clinical important lesions. And there are actually a number of commercially HPV DNA tests available and you have to orient yourself when you want to pick a test. Uh, the first thing you probably should look at is there an FDA approval, but we have now more than 300 commercial test systems worldwide available. The other thing you have to look at, are there publications that compare the new tests against other ones, especially against the tests like hybrid capture against the gold standard. If, the, if you don't find anything, forget about the test. You cannot use it actually. So, but there are tests available, either DNA or RNA based with uh, screening intervals extended up to 10 years providing high safety against precancer and cancer appearing in between the screening intervals, so-called interval, uh, interval cancers. Self-sampling is working. Uh, so you can actually go there with mobile devices in rural areas. And uh, this is a good option. And you always should adopt in rural areas a screen and treat because women are not coming back. You cannot follow them up they might move somewhere else and they're out. So if you have a test result and no treatment, this is bad. VIA often used is not an option as a screening test. It's even worse as triage. 
in contrast, other tests that are portable for HPV are a better uh, option. And it is imperative to overcome lack of awareness between the link uh, of HPV and cancer in the population and among health professionals, because quite a few of them also are not aware of this, to provide training education to the grassroots workers and also to establish good follow-up procedure procedures after a positive screening test. And with that, I would like to thank my colleagues from, uh, from the different departments of OBGYN and pathology, my, my, my group uh, in the medical virology in Tübingen, the group that was uh, in the EC uh, funded trial and the Danish, Danish Cancer Society, where we did a lot of studies, especially the one in Tanzania. And with that, I would like to come to the end and thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. Okay. Uh, I repeat the question. Is there a development in plasma markers? That was the question. No. Uh, actually, uh, I was frequently asked this question. Um, in fact, there is a liquid biopsy uh, a possibility uh, doing NGS on the liquid biopsy uh, to see if there is HPV DNA or RNA. But if this is a place, if this, if you find this actually in the serum, meaning the woman already has cervical cancer, so it's too late. So the, the good thing is actually taking cervical smears. It's a non-invasive procedure, you know, and taking self samples is so easy. You know, it's much easier than diagnosing breast cancer. You're welcome. Thank you very much for a very much nice and wonderful presentation and summarizing the whole story in a very wonderful manner. Uh, my question is that uh, the current therapeutic options which are available in the market, uh, can you please summarize? Well, if you detect, uh, if you detect uh, cervical intraepithelial lesions, uh, grade three or uh, stage 1A cancer, you know, that can be uh, removed by LEAP. So it's a, it's a, it's an electrosurgical uh, 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 procedure where you have a, a heated um, um, wire actually, and you cut out uh, uh, the lesion uh, and uh, yeah, and this uh, preserves, uh, there is no bleeding afterwards. So this is a quite common uh, procedure. Cold knife is actually not longer recommended uh, because of the uh, uh, unwanted side effects, you know. Well, if you go to higher advanced cancer, I mean, then, yeah, you have to get to all the repertoire of radio chemotherapy, everything. I mean, but this is a problem. I mean, because the uh, five years survival rate of cancer uh, stage three or four is really low. And that is probably the reason why mortality here is higher, uh, is going up actually in comparison to incidence rate in Pakistan. So, and I was told by the gynecologist who met in Karachi, actually, that the women, the child, there is a taboo. They don't talk about if they have any symptoms or anything, because at the beginning, even at stage 1A or 1B, there are no symptoms. Okay. And then symptoms then finally develop, and the symptoms are so bad that the woman seeks uh, the advice uh, of, the, of the doctor, of the gynecologist, then it's too late. Okay. Uh, and my second question is that, uh, what is the procedure for culturing this type of virus if we want to go towards the basic drug discovery and therapeutics? So it is somewhat sim similar to the traditional viral culturing? No, not at all. Uh, as I explained in the beginning, papillomaviruses replica replicate only in differentiated epithelium. So you cannot use any monolayer culture uh, to propagate papillomaviruses. You need to do organi organotypic graft cultures, which, uh, uh, which where you have in the tissue culture flask or a plate, you have actually differentiated epithelium. But even under these conditions, which, are, which is still artificial, you know, you have very low production. This is a big problem in the field of papillomavirus research that you cannot grow like other ones, herpes virus, you know, simply in tissue culture, it's not possible. Okay, so there is also an area for the researchers to find out a model, to develop a model for yeah. wild culturing. 
this is why animal models are, uh, uh, are um, animal cervical cancer models they are in the mouse yes okay thank you very much you're welcome okay thank you sir so nice presentation i am just asking about this uh, virus as this is the dna virus uh, is there is any particular gene maybe present which are cause uh, tux, uh, cause of the carcinogenic effect in the uh, human body is can we we have any strategy that we can control this can uh, virus uh, except uh, from the vaccine are this uh, virus is a uh, 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 origin like uh, the coronavirus is come from the different debates we have lesson this is come from the rabbit or some other animals is this virus is also come from some animals which okay. cause which infect the human body yes let me answer the question first question was uh are there specific genes in the virus genome that are responsible for the car carcinogenic activity? Yes, they are. I did not actually uh, tell that because it's not topic of the talk, but this is a E6 and E7 viral oncogenes. And actually, this is also a unique way how they do it because in cervical cancer, for example, you don't find any P53 mutations or you don't find any RB mutations or CDK2 or whatever, or in cyclins, you know, because the papillomavirus do their job by their proteins. The E6 protein attacks P53 and degrades it actually. So the guardian actually of the genome is knocked out. And the same is true for RB. And this is necessary because they don't bring any enzymes with themselves to replicate their DNA. So they have to shift the cell into the proliferation, also not full proliferation, S phase is good enough. Usually it stops at G2, yeah? And then the virus can replicate its viral DNA but if something goes wrong, you know, the cell is not controlled any longer uh, by these uh, uh, tumor suppressor genes, P53 and RB. Uh, the last question was, if, it, uh, if it's a virus that has been, uh, that jumped from other species to humans. Well, uh, we have made phylogenetic trees of all these viruses and it looks like 300 million years ago, they were already associated with, uh, uh, with mamma mammalian species. So I don't, uh, it's, it, and it's a DNA virus with a very low mutation rate. And the second question was, what? Yeah. No, it's not so noted, not at all. As I said, it's strictly species specific. So it co-evolves with the host. Thank you, sir, for your uh, nice presentation. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you for your uh, nice presentation. I am uh, Dr. Nazir from National University of Medical Sciences. My question is regarding uh, vaccination. What age is uh, best for uh, vaccination, like 10 years or less than that? And is there any country which has included vaccination in their national immunization program, keeping yes. in view the you know devastating effects of this virus? Actually, Sue Garland later on is telling you about the Australian experience. They, they were the first country to uh, to have nation, nationwide screen, uh, vaccination programs, and they do it at school. Uh, this is a preferred way actually to do it because there you can reach the right age group, which is now recommended by the WHO of up to 15 years. Uh, and because uh, you see, you know, just to explain one more sentence, the power of the vaccine, because after natural infection, I told you sometimes you don't even find any antibodies against the virus, meaning the immunity wasn't really aware of the infection. Uh, so, and it's a local infection of the mucose epithelium. Now, the vaccine, you actually, uh, you inject it into the arm. And this uh, makes the immune system believe it's a systemic infection. And it's, it's producing a high level of antibody titers. And the antibody titers go down after six months a little bit, and then they stay 
stay uh, at a level of at least 10 to 20 times higher than after natural infection for uh, at least 10 years. And this makes this vaccine so powerful. Is there a need of any booster doses or tertiary doses? Sorry, where are you? Are you, you, you yeah, sorry. Yeah. Is there any need of booster or tertiary doses for lifetime protection? Is vaccine? there which doses? Booster, booster, booster. A booster, a booster. Um, it's like it's a little bit like hepatitis B virus. You know, whenever you find some antibodies, there is probably no need for booster. I think you know the natural booster you uh, you undergo by having a natural infection probably works out is enough. It looks like I mean studies have now shown at least ten years full protection. There was not a single case of breakthrough in the Scandinavian countries where they mon monitor all of this because they have all these registries, vaccination uh, registry, pathology registry, that easily can find out, not a single case of breakthrough. I see, because uh, keeping in view your presentation, uh, I saw at 12 years, uh, people are uh, more prone. And again, 25 years, it's peak. If the protection is provided at least for 10 years, do you think it is recommended uh, like 10 to 12 years for initial dose of vaccine, then booster dose at later on after 10 years? It's, like, it's yeah. you know, at the moment we have sufficient data actually to say that one dose is enough. And the time point should, should be before uh, the girl has, has had contact uh, with those viruses that can cause cervical cancer. I mean, it still works afterwards because you have a higher booster and so on, but the efficacy of the vaccine drops. But that does not mean it's a bad vaccine even then, you know. So there, there are publications showing, showing that women uh, uh, 45 and above that had uh, a zero titer against papillomaviruses, but were at the time of vaccination negative by an HPV test and that were vaccinated, had a protection of 67%. Uh, this is even the same as the flu virus, you know, we, we accept this because there is no better vaccine, but I think this is still good data. I think we have to stop here, or? Oh yeah, sure, sure, please. Can you look it up? Yeah. So we have one question, we have some questions from the virtual participants. We have one question for Mr. Zahedullah. He's asking in some patients, pap smear is negative, but positive for HPV. How can we manage these type of patients? Right. Well, that is not unusual uh, because as I said, uh, pap smear detects cellular abnormal abnormalities. And if you are in the very early infection, you might have an infection without any abnormalities. And uh, meaning uh, the patient, uh, if she has been tested only once and we don't know if it's transient or if it's a persistent infection, it now depends on the age because at the age of 30 and higher, the chance of that the patient when she's positive has already a persistent infection is higher than at younger age. Now to manage these patients, as I said, depends on the age, uh, usually follow up uh, after one year is good. And now why, is, why I say one year, because I dis disregarded this actually in the beginning saying the intervals have to be at least uh, two to three, uh, three years and five years. Uh, this is because when you test somebody for the first time and they are positive, you don't know for how long uh, these women have been positive. And that's why a follow-up after one year is, uh, is, is, is recommended. In a screening program where all women participate in a regular screening, intervals should be uh, in the range of uh, three years or so. So what else do we have here? Is the papillomavirus induced cancer cell metastasis? Yes, sure. I mean, uh, advanced cancers uh, metastasize uh, very well, actually. And this is why the five-year survival rate is not really good. What else do we have? Okay, okay. So stop now, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Thomas Efner. Um, now we will move on to our next uh, talk, which will be delivered by Professor Dr. Vaseem Jafri. Professor Dr. Vaseem Jafri is a professor of medicine and a consultant uh, gastroenterologist and hepatologist at Agahan University, Karachi. 
Dr. Jaffrey is a fellow of Royal College of Physicians um, of London, Edinburgh, Glasgow, and is also a fellow of American College of Physicians and Gastroenterology. Professor, Do uh, Professor Dr. Jaffrey has uh, over 357 publications to his credit. Um, his research work has more than 16,000 citations and his H index is 56. Uh, he, has, uh, he sits on the editorial boards of many national and international journals and has been a um, and has been an academic editor of several um, journals himself. Uh, he is an active member of several societies of his speciality. Um, in addition to that, uh, Dr. Jaffrey has uh, trained scores of physicians in the field of medicine and gastroenterology and hepatology who, uh, who are now heading various national and international institutions. The title of Professor Dr. Jaffrey's to talk today is Health Issues and Viruses. Now I would request Dr. Jaffrey for his talk. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, we've had a very, very comprehensive talk uh, on HPV and, you know, every one of us sitting in the audience must have learned something because there is never something for everyone. My talk is slightly different and it relates to health issues and viruses. My main Speciality interest is liver disease and hepatitis viruses, but I would try to cover, you know, at least from statistical point of view, some of the others which might interest the audience. There are no disclosures. And so HBV, hepatitis B virus, HCV, hepatitis C virus, some passing comments about COVID, HIV, the monkey virus, dengue, and polio. Ladies and gentlemen, the global burden of diseases is enormous and we know that out of that infectious disease, almost like 15 million people really succumb to in infectious diseases globally every year. What about hepatitis B and hepatitis C? So about 15 million, more than 25% of 57 million annual deaths worldwide are estimated to be related directly to infectious diseases. This figure, however, does not include the deaths that occur as a consequence of complications associated with chronic infections, such as liver failure and liver cancer in people infected with hepatitis B or C viruses. End stage liver disease, these two viruses, plus minus hepatitis T virus, produces the end stage liver disease, cirrhosis, more than 783,000 deaths per year, liver cancer, more than 619,000 deaths per year, one of every 40 deaths worldwide really relates to these two illnesses coming from these two entities, Hep B and Hep C. Historically, we are indebted to the following scientists who really worked enormously day in and day out to introduce them to us. Hepatitis B virus in 1965 through enormous contributions from Bruce Bloomberg. In fact, we came to know about it the A virus, hepatitis A virus through the work of Feinstone, Mario Rosetto from Italy, 1977 introduced the Delta or HDV virus. Through the work of Professor Houghton and his lab workers, his, one of his associates was Ku from Singapore working in his lab in California, introduced hepatitis C virus and rise in 1990, 
the hepatitis E virus. Bruce Bloomberg received the Nobel Prize for his distinguished work. He was indeed a great, great scientist, not only introduced the virus to us through enormous amount of work, but also helped us in developing the first vaccine for hepatitis B, which we can say easily was first vaccine to prevent liver cancer because HBV is one of those agents that produce liver cancer. So that's really the vaccination history coming through the work of Professor Bloomberg. Worldwide chronic hepatitis B and C causes 80% of all liver cancers, which is the second most common cause of cancer death. Therefore, a vaccine that protects against the hepatitis B infection can also prevent liver cancer, but everything has to be time-related. If you are too late to prevent hepatitis B, you are too late for everything. The first commercial vaccine got introduced in 1981, followed by the current recombinant techniques using vaccines, which are absolutely safe. It's impossible to get hepatitis B from the new recombinant vaccine. The global prevalence of hepatitis B, around half of the world population reside in HBV endemic area. Around 2 billion people have HBV infection. Global population, 6 billion and 2 billion. So look at the enormity of the problem. 15 to 25 percent die of cirrhosis and liver cancer. Each year, 1 million die of hepatitis B virus related liver failure, cirrhosis, and liver cancer. So that's the map of the World Health Organization. And we know that we reside in Pakistan in the intermediate zone, where the percentages vary from 2 to 8 percent. And this is the map of our own country telling us that yes, we have places within our country which is more than 5% of that area, and there are other places less than 2.5%. When I looked at hepatitis B and C prevalence in ages 1 to 15 in and around Karachi, I found almost 2% at this tender age were already infected for hepatitis B and 1.6% for hepatitis C. Over a period of eight years, when we studied from 2001 to 2008, what's happening with the vaccination and other things that we keep on telling our population and our healthcare providers to do that, we found some positivity, but of course, a lot needs to be done in order to gain support. The study involving over 185,825 individuals, we found that certainly, there is a trend that hepatitis B antibody was getting better in cohort, but certainly not to the desirable level. Can this infection be cured? Vaccination is the need of the hour. You prevent it, that's wonderful. We do not have absolute care of hepatitis B currently with whatever we have. We do have antiviral treatments. We can institute in time in order to reduce the incidence of cirrhosis and HCC, but we do not have a medicine currently which can get rid of surface antigen, which is the hallmark of hepatitis B, unless we develop the surface antibody, which is naturally developed through our own immune system or through the vaccination process, if given in time. The currently available treatment, as you can see, you know, the hepatitis B surface antigen loss is dismal, 2%, 3.2%, 2.9% in E antigen positive HPV patients and E antigen negative, even worse, 0.3%, 0% and 0.6%. So in the next decades, the next 10 years or beyond, we will have several options, the antivirals plus the immunotherapy coming in and the scientists are working day in and day out for, you know, for our patients' population and for healthcare providers so that we hopefully would be offering cure of hepatitis B in future. Currently, we have a control 
but no cure for HBV. You can see the bottom half of the slide, the CCC DNA persists within the liver because if you stop the treatment, it starts to regenerate and come back. So that's what the current status is. So it's prevention through vaccination. We have a very, very effective vaccine. And again, country like ours is plagued with unfortunate ideas where vaccination is blamed for unnecessary events in life. As Professor Iqbal mentioned this morning, the tragedy that happens to the lady health visitors when they give polio vaccine to you know, the little kids and newborns and whatnot, and you know what happens to them at times, which is most unfortunate. Vaccines are safe, they save human life, and of course they must be given at the right time. Look at Taiwan. They introduced this thing at the right time. So there was a 60.1% decrease in the incidence of liver cancer, 76.3% decrease in mortality from fulminant hepatic failure, and 92% decrease in mortality from chronic liver disease over decades since the vaccine was introduced in Taiwan. Can't we follow that? We can, the world can and learn a lot about it. The, the, the key message is when to give it right at the birth of the child. The sooner the better, the same hour, the same day, at least within the same week. But this is still not happening in our country and you know that so effectively. The time of vaccination must be introduced through whatever means we can. We have been asking about it. WHO is asking about it, but who listens? The common cultural prevalence continues. And unfortunately, the results really do not uh, tell us that we are going anywhere near to success. So 24 hours is the best time within the first day of birth. If not, then at least try giving it even after seven days, a late birth dose can still be effective in preventing horizontal transmission and therefore must remain beneficial. And of course, and the other high risk group, the healthcare providers, the paramedics, the nurses, anybody who gets into contact with blood with potentially infected hepatitis B patients. What about those hemodialysis patients? Time and again, the highest prevalence of hepatitis B and C is people who have had you know, multiple transfusions and multiple sessions of dialysis. So those groups and the HIV sufferers and H, you know, the transplanted patients, those whose immunity is compromised, they are at serious risk of getting it and we must vaccinate them in time. Vaccination is absolutely safe in pregnancy and in lactating women and a birth dose can be given to low birth weight and premature infants. So that is again, a key message. You know, people ask about it and this must be very clear. Of course, with the recent pandemic of COVID-19 and hepatitis elimination program, we are signatory to WHO and the World Hepatitis Alliance that by 2030, hepatitis needs to be, would be eliminated in, in globally. And Pakistan is a signatory to that. And of course, signatory to many other, you know, other things. So ladies and gentlemen, today we are fighting with an important public health threat, the COVID-19, which certainly needs special attention, but we should be more careful about our previous public health achievements. If we cannot have progress about them these days, at least we should keep them at the current situation and avoid stepping backwards to reach the goal of viral hepatitis elimination by 2030. HCV discovery of the virus, ongoing elimination efforts, target 2030. This is almost coming to the end of you know, 2022. Just look at the time frame that is left. So we all know that when I told you in my beginning slides that through the work of Bloomberg and Alter in 1965, HBV was known. Feinstone and his associates, 1973, the puzzle was still there because we were getting hepatitis in our post-transfusion patients because B was checked and A doesn't produce chronicity. 
but still people after transfusions were getting it. So that was transfusion associated hepatitis, not due to viral hepatitis type A or B. So it was labeled like that during that time when C was not introduced. I looked into it and found out in 1989 that 10% of post-transfusion hepatitis was caused by this unidentified virus, and we would call it non-A, non-B at that time because it was not introduced. And then this wonderful work came from Professor Houghton in California and through his colleagues, isolation of a cDNA clone derived from a blood-borne non-A, non-B viral hepatitis genome, and that was labeled as hepatitis. These are the two wonderful sightness, and they all won several awards, including this one. So when Michael Houghton wrote about this as a summary, the molecular identification of HCV was the culmination of a team effort, which always is, spanning seven years during which hundreds of millions of bacterial cDNA clones were screened for a putative non-A, non-B hepatitis origin using many different approaches. Only one positive clone was the result of this strenuous effort. If we had missed or lost 511 from the library, we may still be looking for HCV. So those efforts have to be acknowledged and we are highly indebted to all these wonderful, wonderful people who have worked day in and day night to increase our knowledge. So initially, what we used to call Transfusion associated non A, non B hepatitis 1975, transmitted to chimpanzees 1978. The genome was cloned, as I said, in 1989, and initially it was classified within the Flaviviridae and Hepatitis C virus. Zero prevalence of hepatitis C, almost 200 million worldwide, and 70 million people with chronic hepatitis data 2015 hasn't really altered a great deal, but I'm sure, you know, it would with the passage of time because we have absolute cure of hepatitis C right now. Look at where we stand in Pakistan after China. China has billions of people as a population. We were screened and we found that our number was number two in the entire world for the serology of hepatitis C virus, which is HCV antibody. So that's how, in fact, we exist. The Pakistan Medical and Research Council through their work in 27 and 8 found that the prevalence of surface antigen within our country was 2.5. Anti-HCV, you know, 4.9, it was over 30, 40% in some of the districts, but the overall aggregate came as 4.9. Overall, B and C together, 7.5%. Injection practices in our country is very, very rife. People like injections as if it's you know going to cure them tomorrow and day after, and the general practitioners really are ready to give that. And there had been several studies by us at my colleagues in different institutions that they were the starting point. If you use a contaminated syringe or needle, you are not doing any favor to your patient. You are doing more harm to several rather than one. So through our own work, we found that HCV was positive within the age bracket of 1 to 15 in almost like 1.6 and B1.8. So this is how when we looked at zero prevalence and risk factors of hep CV amongst the male prisoners in Karachi and look at the figure of almost 20%. And of course, glass syringes and everything else that happens in those correction facilities or whatever one may call them, the prisons, sharing razors, et cetera, and illiteracy. There are six major genotypes. They were very, very important when we are struggling to cure it through interferon. And Pakistan's genotype through our work was genotype three, which was you know, responsive to interferon, and it was 87. Most of uh, Europe and North America genotype one, which was not as responsive to interferon therapy. 27% of cirrhotic patients due to hepatitis C, this is a global burden, every fifth. 
25% of liver cancer related to hepatitis C, again, a global figure. And when we looked at our own cohort of hepatitis C patients, we found almost 70% of our liver cancer patients were related to hepatitis C virus and 21.8 to B virus and concomitant B with C or D in 10.3%. The primary goal of HCV treatment is viral eradication. That means cure, sustained virological response. If you are able to achieve that, we reduce the all-cause mortality from 26 to less than 10%, liver-related mortality from almost 30% to less than 2%, and liver cancer from 22% to less than you know, almost 5%. So we have to treat them cure them, and we bring a lot of relief to patients and their families because we reduce morbidity and mortality. We were very lucky in 19, 2013 with the start of direct oral medications for hepatitis C, and by 16, there are hosts of medications available to us in Pakistan and rest of the world. We are again very lucky through our you know, uh, pharmaceutical industries because we brought all those medicines at almost peanut prices in Pakistan compared to you pay the same thing in United States and some other countries through you know, uh, generics and whatnot. So everything is available to us and we can see that the genotype doesn't make much of a difference now. One through six, all are treated effectively with the currently available hepatitis C medicines. We do not have a vaccine for hepatitis C like we have for B and papillomavirus and others that we will be discussing due to genotypes, subgenotypes, isolate, and hundreds of quasi species. So no vaccine now or in the near future. High rate of viral persistence, lack of solid immunity and genetic heterogeneity are the main reasons why the vaccine cannot be developed so far but scientists don't rest. They're still working on it. Hopefully one day one would see that something good as a what next? Elimination is our target by 2030 as WHO and other Hepatitis Alliance and others have you know, listed. It. Why do we have to think about that? Because viral hepatitis is producing more deaths than most of the other things that produce, again, lots of morbidity and mortality like HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. When we talk of elimination, we still require continued measures to prevent reestablishment of the disease transmission. However, with eradication, if a disease has been eradicated, no further control measures are required. So we are talking of elimination of viral hepatitis by 2030, and we should be cognizant of this fact that the preventive measures, the vaccinations, and all those have to continue for us to stay you know, on the right path. Is it a myth or reality? One can consider you know, individually where we are residing. The countries do not have the same resources all over the world. And so we need energy, commitment, and resources. Is that easy? A public health approach and it has to be integrated, equitable, no differentiation, male, female, poor, rich, you know, age brackets, everyone has to be on the same setting. Partnerships, the government alone may not be able to do that, but an honest government can do many, many good things with civil society and private sector would contribute. They'll come forward straight away when they know that money and efforts are being spent in the right direction, concrete and tailored action. So in Pakistan, yes, it, maybe it's not a myth with everything coming together in 2030, standing on a, this platform or somewhere, we might say that, yes, we have achieved the target. And this is in, again in the sustainable uh, you know, global uh, ports that we are signatory to. So we need to work together for HIV, malaria, sexually transmitted diseases, we have just discussed the papillomavirus, tuberculosis, and viral hepatitis. So what is the vision? Towards the vision of where viral hepatitis transmission is halted and everyone living with viral hepatitis has access to safe, affordable, and effective prevention, care, 
and treatment services. Everyone, not any distinction. WHO Global Health Sector Strategy on Viral Hepatitis 2016. So what are we are talking about? We are talking about HBV vaccination, almost reaching 90% 2030. To prevent mother to child transmission, the birth dose within 24 hours, 90%. Safe injection practices, 90%. Harm reduction, 75, seven dose inject drugs and all kinds of other nonsense. We have to really look about those individuals too. We cannot ignore people who are in our you know, prisons and correction facilities and all that. HBV treatment should be made available to more than 80% and so is HCV. In 2015, when all this was happening, less than 1% were being globally, HBV treatment was there, less than 1% for HCV treatment. So yes, the figures look gigantic, but efforts and all those things needs to be pulled up so that we achieve what we want to achieve. By doing that, if we are able to do that, six, six to 10 million infections in 2015, reduced to nine, less than a million, 900,000 by 2030. 1.4 million deaths in 2015 to less than 500 deaths, 500,000 by 2030. So it would be you know, worth considering it, doing it for both hepatitis B and C. So a people-centered health system for hepatitis elimination has to come in where all these things that are listed here have their importance. A national strategy, a workforce budget for the provision effective surveillance and monitoring, strategies for engaging you know, former and active PWIDs, and capacitor to monitor disease progression. Once we really look into all these things, then certainly the results would be optimized. So we need a national health program. Do we have it? People say you have it. Has anybody seen it? Maybe. But you know, if it is in shelves and you know those places, and where it is not available with the click of mouse on anywhere, then yes, it is resting comfortably well. The best country that has shown enormous amount of good results is Egypt. They have a national plan of action under the you know, sort of low and middle income groups. They have done wonders so far and they are on the verge and they had over 40% of hepatitis B C prevalence at that time and they are on the verge of elimination. Essential goals are to secure political commitment for HCV elimination. We must start universal screening. It could be through a variety of sources and non-traditional screening site, people coming to the emergency department, attending the gynecologic treatment, the dental treatment, whatever. So if we start that, of course, we would be screening more patients rather than just the hepatologist, GI or internist doing it. So we must, so non-traditional screening sites should be taken and screening modalities have to be improved. So what is the target? Evaluate 80% of the population, look at our population, treat 85% and cure 85% because the cure rate currently for C is overwhelming 95% and above. So as I've already said, Egypt is showing us, you know, massive success in this program. If we, if, you know, I've been to Egypt many times and they've been here and they tell us, you know, good news each time you visit. So once again, if we are there to, for that be eliminated globally by 2030, leaving no one behind towards equitable global elimination of hepatitis C, this was one of our work which got appreciated. And the whole idea is that the national government and government health communities, global health communities must recognize the risk of history repeating itself and not allow hepatitis C to follow the same path as tuberculosis. We are struggling. This is one such country which has got the highest number of multi-drug resistant illnesses, including tuberculosis, including typhoid, because the misappropriate use of antibiotics and drugs are really the gist of this story. With the incidence of hepatitis C on the rise, the role of drug resistance still unknown and the importance of poverty elimination, alleviation underplayed the warning signs as they are to see. Our time is now. 
let's combine the fantastic opportunity presented by the development of directly acting antivirals with knowledge sharing, national leadership, and necessary financial commitments to meet the WHO goal of eliminating C and B as the public health threat globally by 2030. So that was basically highlighting the area that I interest me most. What about the COVID latest statistics? This was as recent as 23rd of September. Globally, 611, 421, so lots and lots of vaccinations have happened for hepatitis, uh, for COVID-19, and that has paid the dividends. What about the HIV key facts to reach the proposed global nine, our country is not spared of HIV, we know that. 95, 95, 95 targets set by UN AIDS. So we need to be cognizant of this fact that we have to give importance to this disease as well. We should not ignore it and we have to follow what is required of us in order to do that. There is no cure yet of HIV, but there is plenty of treatment available which can make our patients less morbid and hence they can you know, live uh, not satisfactorily, but with treatment, you know, a good quality of life. We are recently introduced by the monkey virus key facts in California and some other places in the United States and others. I was pretty ignorant of this thing as well, but once I read it, I was fascinated that vaccines used during the smallpox eradication program also provided protection against monkey virus. Newer vaccines have been developed of which one has been approved for the prevention of monkeypox. Hopefully we don't have it here, but who knows? In fact, because of the global travel, you know, we may have this new Thing coming back to us and we should be ready for it and hopefully deal with it in time. So it's a viral zoonotic disease that occurs primarily in tropical rainforest areas of Central and West Africa and is occasionally exported to other regions. We are plagued with dengue currently, aren't we? With the floods and rains and all that and we are scared because who can prevent a mosquito coming into his office or room or wherever or in this auditorium for that matter. Nobody can. And if this mosquito has already got the dengue, then in fact, anyone can get it. And then you have to really struggle with, you know, getting yourself no specific treatment, just supportive treatment. And it produces a lot of morbidity and mortality. And WHO reports higher incidence of dengue coming in since 2000. And one has to be really, really you know, uh, about these things. One has to be sensitive about it. And wherever you see water and all that nonsense that is around us, in fact, where mosquitoes really harbor like anything, where are the health authorities and others to look into it more seriously? Polio has not been eradicated from Pakistan yet. Perhaps this is the most unfortunate statement that we still get these things and what happens to our lady health visitors that visit those remote areas in order to give those few drops into a baby's mouth. The ignorance really is tremendous and that, again, it's very simple to get rid of that ignorance because a community concept come, has to come in where all those people who are against it must be born and taught and all those things can come to rescue for those wonderful, wonderful, wonderful lady health visitors that do an enormous job. So as both strains have officially certified so as globally eradicated as a 2020 wild polio type one affects two countries, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Ladies and gentlemen, we know that viruses do have oncogenetic potentials and you've heard a great talk by my uh, professor here, Thomas uh, Smith. So we have got a whole list of viruses, the EBV virus, have B and C, I've told, the HPV, HTLV1, and then going on to Merkel cell polio, vi polio virus, BK, and the list is incomplete. They don't start with cancer, they start with infection, and if we are able to 
treat them, know them, get rid of them, we are probably saving human lives and morbidity. But you have cured hepatitis B and C, the potentials of cancer do not disappear. Even after cure, these patients have to be followed lifelong with the relevant test so that doesn't get that problem. So I've been asked that I've overstepped my time. So thanks ever so much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Jaffe, for your talk. Uh, so let me see if we have any questions for you in the chat box. Um, so there is a general comment from Dr. Zahedullah. Uh, he's saying, sir, we have some unpublished data regarding HCV PCR positive cases not responding, which means resistant to antiviral Therapy, this may be due to increase in untypable uh, hepatitis C virus variants. What do you say about this? Yeah, I have to say only one thing that uh, hepatitis C, or for that matter, any infection, when did I say that it is 100% curable? Because at the same time, one has to look into it you know, the patient's compliance is very important. What drugs we are using, are we using the right combination of drugs, you know, and, you know, appropriate uh, dosages and all that, and give it with a combination. If it's not three months, then six months, and depending on the strains, et cetera, and the cirrhotic patient, they do not respond as well as non-cirrhotic. One needs to add a ribavirin to the treatment and all that, and of course, if we look into all those aspects and still it is not curable, then certainly we wait for even better, you know, drugs to come up and keep this patient under observation so that when appropriate, we can offer a better treatment. We can even combine interferon with the currently available. I have done it and my colleagues all over the world where we have offered, you know, all kinds of help from the, the official treatment or adding treatment from our previous experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I hope uh, this answers this question. Um, so as, as you know that we are running out of time, so we will take more questions from uh, for Professor Jaffrey in the end part, in the later part of today's uh, sessions, inshallah. Uh, we have uh, Professor Dr. Petty Gravit with us uh, online. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Professor Gravit uh, for waiting. Uh, very kind of you. So in, to introduce Professor Dr. Gravit, Professor Dr. Petty Gravit is the Deputy Director, Center of Global Health, National Cancer Institute, USA. Uh, in this role, she implements science efforts and provides scientific and programmatic um, directions across research, training, partnership, and dissemination goals. Dr. Gravit is a molecular epidemiologist whose research in human papillomaviruses and cervical cancer spans the transnational spectrum from the natural history of genital infection across the lifespan to the translation of evidence-based prevention to tools to low and middle income countries. The title of her talk today is How Knowing the Natural History of Human Papillomaviruses Has Informed Survival Cervical Cancer Prevention. With this, I request Professor Dr. Gravit for her talk, please. Hey, thank you so much. I am attempting to share the correct screen and if someone can let me know if that's working. No, pretty. Yes, yes, no, it no, works. That's see. okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, really wonderful talks that came before and I realized when I was listening to Professor Ifner's talk that I, I maybe was a little bit uh, too close to uh, his information. And so I'm changing my talk a little bit and I'm, I'm very glad that I did because I think it follows on um, from Dr. Joffrey's talk um, quite well because I think what was being brought up is that we have to approach 
um, our elimination goals, our sustainable development goals in a much more holistic way. Um, we can't really isolate all of these different viruses and the scourges they, um, they cause. They're, they're not behaving independently. And so um, I think what I'm going to do today is to, um, to repeat the talk that I gave in Karachi earlier this week um, to talk more about the process that we might use to use the evidence-based tools that our research has um, been able to afford us to prevent cervical cancer and particularly how we table these, um, tailor these tools to the appropriate context. And so as I'm sure you've already um, heard and have been talking about the WHO cervical cancer elimination strategy is to um, ensure that we get 90% of girls vaccinated, 70% screened and 90% of those with screen positive results requiring treatment to, um, to actually achieve the treatment. And um, I think that one of the things I wanna point out in this slide is this, this really is starting to bring together a variety of different scientific disciplines in order for us to close the care gap in cervical cancer prevention. And we at the Center for Global Health in particular are really committed to increasing the equity and an opportunity to prevent cervical cancer in our global populations through integrated technological innovations, such as the highly efficacious HPV vaccines, highly sensitive screening tests, new triage options, including um, automated visual evaluation using an AI algorithm, um, as well as novel point of care treatments like portable thermal ablation, integrating with those with the social innovations that are gonna be required to effectively deliver these technological advances to the population who needs them. And that's including the things that you may hear more about from Dr. Garland, later this afternoon in terms of school-based or community-based vaccine strategies. How can we increase coverage, for example, using self-sampling strategies with HPV testing of our already infected um, target female populations? How may we um, use automated triage with genotyping or mobile phone reminders, for example, to ensure that women who are positive receive their results and um, follow up to the next level of care? And then other things like maybe task shifting treatment to primary care settings where possible to just make it simply more accessible to the women. And I wanna give you an example of how we've used a systems thinking approach in the Peruvian Amazon through the Proyecto Precancer to meet screening elimination goals in close collaboration and partnership with the health system uh, providers and authorities themselves. <clears throat> this was an implementation research study using participatory action research and systems thinking to test strategies to improve cervical screening reach and to decrease loss to follow up after a positive test result in Iquitos, Peru. And I'll tell you a little bit more about this setting in a second. <clears throat> and just to tell you to begin, and then I'm going to tell you how we got here. What we found is that after implementation of HPV-based screening, we actually surpassed the screening coverage goals until COVID shut down the, the screening system and primary health facilities altogether. <clears throat> but as soon as the COVID testing, as the COVID uh, restrictions were lifted, the health system was able to show incredible resilience, got their screening coverage right back to where it needed to be. And this was also true in showing the follow-up management of the 20% of women who were testing positive in the screening. Um, <clears throat> so by the time that we um, had paused to do this analysis, 76% of primary health facilities were meeting or surpassing screening goals with HPV testing where none were using a visual inspection with acetic acid uh, test method prior to that. And we had changed within just six to nine months post-implementation in our uh, collectively designed strategy um, where 30% of women with BIA were completing care um, when referred to the hospital for colposcopy. By task shifting, we managed to get 70% of HPV positive women to care. And so what I wanna really focus on for the rest of my talk is how did a systems approach enable implementation and resilience in this health system? And again, you can see here that our research team works just you know, hand in hand from the very beginning with our partners. And this is just a slide to tell you what I mean when I say systems thinking. 
<clears throat> is kind of making some connections differently. So in conventional thinking, we think problems and causes are obviously connected. And in systems thinking, those connections are not often that obvious. Um, in conventional thinking, we tend to blame others. In systems thinking, we acknowledge that we are often part of the problem. In conventional sh thinking, short-term success is thought to lead to long-term successes. And in systems thinking, we acknowledge that most quick fixes may yield no difference or even could make matters worse over time. And that's often because we're optimizing part by part instead of trying to improve the relationships among the parts. And finally, and this has been a very difficult thing um, because when people are very excited to make change, um, sometimes we can go a little too fast. And so conventionally it's do as much as you can as quickly as you can. And in systems thinking, it's focused on a few key coordinated changes over time. And I think that we can learn a lot from how we're doing this. For example, from the previous talk with the hepatitis control measures and, and how we can learn from each other and those efforts relative to what we are doing for HPV um, elimination. <clears throat> so we, um, with uh, guidance from the Omid Yards Group Six Systems Practice, developed an integrative systems practice for implementation research or our INSPIRE model. And I'll go through how we use this phase by phase <clears throat> where we fought before intervening, we actually spent time with the system stakeholders to understand their system, then work together to discuss where there was a leverage to change for improvement in the system of cervical screening, then actually act on those changes that were decided together, and then evaluate, learn, and adapt, and continue to make more change. And so that we're trying to set up an iterative learning health system um, so that always we can be responding to the, con the adaptive responses and, and um, unanticipated events such as COVID that might um, you know, waylay base, best laid plans. <clears throat> this health systems partnership started um, from a traditional observational epi research study. And I'm gonna divert just a little bit here because I, I, I kind of looked this up after our talk last week. What we were doing is <clears throat> doing HPV testing with self-sampling in the Peruvian Amazon to simply look to see whether soil transmitted helminth infections in adult women were associated with an increase in HPV prevalence. And we saw that that also, those infections were associated with uh, type two cytokine signature in cervical fluids. What we saw essentially is that while HPV prevalence goes down and with age in helminth infected women, it's quite high and stays high across all ages in helminth infected women. Um, I did look up kind of what the burden of uh, soil transmitted helmets were in Pakistan and particularly in the northern regions. A recent WHO um, survey study, I think in two, 2017, showed that um, <clears throat> the combined STH um, infection prevalence, it's hookworm, ascaris, and trichuris, was somewhere between 20 and 50 percent. And definitely the entire country um, certainly can um, support helminth transmission. This is important because um, in many ways, um, we're, we're the only ones who are started to look at helminth infection in HPV natural history. And this is a, a scoping review that one of our fellows at the NCI Center for Global Health is working on, where she's looked at several studies, including many um, looking at schistosomiasis in Africa. And you can see that the effect estimates on either HPV prevalence, HSIL, um, or CIN or cervical cancer are increased in association with adult women being helminth infected. So this may be so, an important thing to consider um, as you're thinking about your HPV control measures uh, in, in Pakistan. But anyway, what happened from this study is that as we were doing HPV self-sampling <clears throat> and identifying those women that were at risk in partnership with the health system um, providers, the nurse midwives, you know, they came to us and said, the self-collected HPV test you used in this research would actually work much better for us screening women in our region. <clears throat> Aren't people doing that elsewhere? And, and that was very true. A lot of European countries, Australia and the United States had started using HPV testing as a, um, either a co-test or a primary screen. So we worked with the health system to apply for, um, for grants 
in order to investigate um, whether we could use um, implementation research to try to see if we could get an HPV test into the system. Um, <clears throat> and this is just to acknowledge our funding sources and my co-PI, uh, Valerie Pasoldan. So again, the context of where we were working, I think would look very familiar to, to a lot of you. This is um, <clears throat> Iquitos. This is the largest city in the Peruvian Amazon. You can reach Iquitos only by air or by boat. There's no way to drive a car through the very dense um, jungles um, that, that surround it. You can see that cervical cancer is the first leading cause of cancer death in women 15 to 44 years. And that's despite the fact that the country reports about a 60% screening coverage with PAPS or VIA. We were doing and conducting the study um, in collaboration with our partners in the largest public health network in Iquitos, Peru, the Microred Iquitos Sur, who had a population of about 20,000 women who were screen eligible from 30 to 49 years with HPV testing according to the Peruvian national guidelines. <clears throat> so this is just showing you where Iquitos is relative to the capital city of Lima. And one of the, the primary health facilities um, within the network where we were working. When we brought our partners together, we anchored our discussions around the cervical cancer screening elimination goals and simply asked ourselves, can this health system change their screening to meet those elimination goals? Is this gonna be feasible? And again, we used the INSPIRE methodology to guide how we, what process we took um, to accomplish these discussions and actions. <clears throat> and so our first part was to understand the system. So to develop mental models of how the system should be working and establish a narrative of what that is, what the, what's the what is from different stakeholder uh, perspectives of their current screening system. And then to make all of those different mental models from different stakeholder perspectives um, visible so that they could be discussed all together. And we did this through a series of different research methodologies. As defined in their cancer control plan, which um, was yes, indeed a document on a shelf, but was actually um, attempting to be um, implemented in, in, in the public health system, is that they had a combination of either VIA or PAP screening, which just depended on what kind of training the nurse midwives who conducted screening in the primary health facilities had. <clears throat> if those screen tests were positive, those women would be referred to colposcopy um, at one of the regional hospitals. And depending on the results of colposcopy, if they were found to have significant precancer then or cancer, they were treated at the, those same hospitals. <clears throat> but as we moved through this process, what we could see is that when you started to ask people from their different perspectives, can you just show me the flow chart of how your screening works? So let's just put ourselves in a patient's shoes and walk her through kind of what happens. You can see it started at the, as this kind of whiteboard exercise. We didn't get very far. It was very clear that there was confusion about how the system was interconnected and who was doing what. And so we went out and interviewed and discussed with multiple different stakeholders along the screening care continuum um, <clears throat> and made a, a very elaborate system map of the pap smear screening process, the VIA screening process, and then if positive, what happened if you were referred to hospital one and what happened if you were referred to hospital two. And what we could see is that when we made this visible to all the stakeholders, first of all, they were quite surprised at the complexity of their system, because once, you know, what they thought in their minds to be true when they actually saw after we, they explained to us what was happening is that the system was indeed quite complex. There were many delays. There were often redundancies. There was fragmentation where one part of the system didn't know what the other part was doing, which again, led to more redundancies. And <clears throat> often there was no standardization of procedures and that's particularly true at the hospital level. We also did an audit of the system to see, okay, well, given this complex system that you're operating with, how well are you doing in terms of first um, meeting your screening goals? And an 18 month audit of the screening showed stable monthly screening rates by VIA and non-pregnant women but that was consistently meeting only about 25% of their monthly screening targets, which if you're screening with VIA once every three years, 
And this population of 20,000 women would be about 390 screens per month in the 17 health facilities combined. <clears throat> we also audited and looked at what happened when BIA positive women were referred to the hospital. What we found is that 62.2% um, had absolutely no evidence that they ever went to the hospital um, based on their referral from their primary screening test and only about 30% completed care where we could find evidence that they had a normal colposcopy or they had less than SIN2 on biopsy or they had had treatment of SIN2 plus. So we probed what they thought the reasons for low reach and screening may have been. And those included the fact that Iquitos has only one main paved road. Otherwise people are connected to health centers by dirt roads and rivers. <clears throat> and you can see that that could become really challenging particularly during times of heavy rains. Primary health centers themselves were quite well placed and accessible to communities, but they had fewer staff who had to deliver, as you might all well imagine, multiple prevention programs, as well as the basic health care. And they had limited beds um, to do speculum exams. Also, when we looked at the training capacity of the nurse midwives, there was limited training to do VIA or to take a pap smear. And that was more true in the most rural health facilities. <clears throat> we asked about why women were being lost to follow up and found that there were lots of cognitive barriers about just not understanding the process. There were structural barriers in terms of challenges in ever receiving their results or scheduling appointments, having long wait times at the hospital, um, the providers being unavailable, um, broken equipment, for example, and then financial barriers where even though the service was supposed to be delivered um, without cost in the public health system, the providers at the hospital were often asking for payments or for the uh, out-of-pocket payment to go and get medicines or procedures or supplies for procedures. And so we took this information and just had really honest discussions amongst all the stakeholders about what was happening and what we could do to change um, in a positive way to meet elimination goals. <clears throat> and this was identifying all the stakeholders that were involved in these discussions. It included people from the community. It included all of the service delivery level um, healthcare providers, laboratory technicians, oncologists and gynecologists and other expert doctors at the hospital levels in both hospitals. <clears throat> the authorities within the regional Ministry of Health, um, some information from the National Ministry of Health and the insurance network, as well as the South Iquitos uh, Health, Health Network um, authorities. And they worked together to take those visuals that I showed before and also things like swim lane visualization so that we could actually look at the system from a woman's perspective and track where is she going from her community to primary care to oncology departments, um, admissions, gynecology, <clears throat> to the obstetra and midwives within oncology and to the pathology laboratory. And you can start to see from a patient's perspective, you know, how complex and how complicated her transition through this care pathway was, which means that everyone started to realize you know, it was confusing to all of us imagine what it's like to a, a woman um, who is not part of this system and was feeling reasonably healthy and just asked to be screened. It was very unlikely that she was going to be willing to go through these very complicated processes. And so in thinking about what we could do to improve the system, we realized that um, in cervical cancer, we're very fortunate to have a large toolbox from which to select an evidence-based screening program that matches any setting, no matter the resource. And then how did we choose that? <clears throat> well, in these discussions, um, we looked at all the different options of, of which type of test we could use. Um, what, did we need to do a secondary screening test or a triage test? Did we require or not to have a pathological diagnosis? There was only one anatomic pathologist in the entire um, Iquitos region. And then if we wanted to do treatment, which treatment type would we need? And to, we'd have to make decisions on all these points and with always our goal of the 70-90. And in those discussions, <clears throat> what we did as researchers was simply facilitate the discussion, not to, you know, at, with data and support, 
and also just making sure stakeholders were questioning their decisions in terms of the feasibility of that choice, the acceptability. And when we ask about acceptability, it's the acceptability among multiple different stakeholders, the affordability of the choice, sustainability, and most importantly, the equitability of whether this choice would actually reach the majority of the women who are in need and to have an opportunity for cervical cancer prevention in the area. <clears throat> One of the things that um, we decided to do, um, the health system did, is they balanced the feasibility and desirability of trying to get you know, high quality uh, screening tests and treatment that would match the feasibility of making sure that they thought they could get a higher screening coverage and less loss to follow up. And they did this essentially by reducing the complexity of their system. So they decided to go for HPV testing and allow self-sampling to increase the screening reach. And then to refer the positive HPV uh, women to uh, a primary health facility where they'd be evaluated and treated by thermal ablation if they were eligible and only refer those who are not eligible to colposcopy at the hospital level. <clears throat> the ultimate goal that we kept in mind when making those choices is that we want to provide all women the same opportunity to prevent cervical cancer, and this often means using a different set of tools in different populations based on what their resources are, what the perceptions around screening and uh, treatment are, and the values that are held. And this is a very important one-size-fits-does-not-fit-all um, kind of reminder. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through this, but we did very simple scenario analysis to really kind of look at the impact in <clears throat> across different assumptions of screening test sensitivity, specificity, and coverage, um, and retention and care on the impact of the percent of women with precancers we think that we would find and treat how many we would overtreat and what kind of resources would be needed in the system. And again, that was to find a solution that was acceptable to all. <clears throat> and it was important in these conversations to um, help people to understand that often, you know, you may have somebody at a hospital level who's looking at the system, you know, from this perspective and seeing, you know, an orange square, and then you've got primary health facilities um, personnel who are looking from this perspective at the same screening system and seeing a blue circle and helping us to all realize both of these things are true. Um, again, this is the screening system then that we established. In phase three of our INSPIRE model, we act strategically. So we developed implementation teams to initiate the changes and plan for them at the primary level for screening <clears throat> and ablative treatment at the referral level for improved um, excisional treatment. We developed uh, a variety of new infrastructures, including an HPV laboratory, um, which you can see was using two of the Cepheid gene expert instruments, um, and then had training teams, <clears throat> both for laboratory, for thermal ablation, as you can see here, and also for communication and counseling of women, because this is an important um, change for them as well. And so in phase four, we simply um, look back and ask ourselves again, you know, how did the changes that we made um, actually work in real in real time? <clears throat> Were any of our assumptions that we made in, in making those plans um, incorrect? And did we need to make new changes? And so we essentially started the whole iterative process over again. Again, creating new shared visualization to check our planning decisions, probe what's working, what isn't, who's involved, and where we could have the highest leverage to change and make things easier, better, more efficient. Um, <clears throat> We looked at the evidence of acceptability. So here we have um, really looked carefully at the experience of women with the treatment process at the primary care center um, and really found that the women believed the treatment was well worth the um, physical and emotional challenges. They were grateful for the treatment, which offered fast resolution. They would recommend the program to others and they wanted to expand the program to other health facilities. And as this, particularly the task shifting of the treatment to primary centers, you could see the women getting there and, and really um, being grateful for the fast resolution. Um, the primary care doctors and the um, expert physicians at the hospital <clears throat> all started to realize that this was a much more efficient method um, given the resources that they had. And it left only those who had the most 
severe advanced disease needing the expert care, where women with positive HPV test results with needing just a screen and treat ablation um, could easily be resolved at a primary level. And so what we found in the end is that our screening coverage, if you look at the, we had four urban health facilities, seven peri-urban and six rural health facilities and averaging across each of these, <clears throat> you can see here's our 70% screening coverage goal. So you see that this is pre-implementation in red and post-implementation in blue. So after implementation of HPV with self-sampling, um, all three regions of the uh, health network in, you know, surpassed their screening coverage goals. But what you can particularly see is that was true in the rural and peri-urban areas, which had a really high uptake of the self-sampling. And we believe that this was particularly important, again, because the training and the uh, resources in these facilities was much lower than those in the more urban settings. <clears throat> and this is a really wonderful um, example of how implementing with equity in mind actually can work. And you can see again, as I've said, our hospital follow-up was about 30% um, when we were following uh, just, uh, just under 200 VIA positive women over 18 months. When we changed to HPV, we tripled the number of women that we were actually um, screening and screening positive. So now we had 604 women and over <clears throat> just nine months of follow-up we managed to get 70% of those um, to a completion of care endpoint. And I think that continues to improve to this day. So we were falling slightly short of our 90% goals, but again, I think it's improving, um, improving every day despite COVID lockdowns, despite supply chain disruptions, despite dengue outbreaks. Um, so in the end, I believe it was this partnership that we had in designing and redesigning the programs that's really led to the resilience of their strategies um, and the acceptability and willingness to continue to improve the system over time to keep this sustained. So I just want to thank those um, individuals, our different um, institutional partners that we worked with in Peru, and I'll just end with a quote from a seminal systems thinker that I really um, liked to, to end on. And I really believe that we, if we take this perspective, we'll do so much good um, for our populations. We can't impose our will on a system, but we can listen to what the system tells us and discover how its properties and our values can work together to bring forth something much better than could ever be produced by our will alone. And with that, I really thank you for your uh, attention and I'm happy to take questions. I know we're probably over time, but um, I can also respond in the chat. <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Gravett. Uh, do we have any questions uh, from the audience? So let me see if I have some questions uh, for you in the chat box. All right, so we do not have questions in the chat box for Dr. Gravett. Uh, once again, is there any question? Yeah, we have one question. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice presentation, uh, Dr. Gravett. I am Dr. Nazir from NUMS National University of Medical Sciences. I would like to ask a question. Is it not possible to include screening and these things uh, in part of the uh, programs which are already uh, existing, like FELTP, Field Epidemiology and Laboratory Testing System, present in all uh, <clears throat> health departments of Pakistan. Do you think it will be more applicable and helpful to do the screening and the testing in more systematic way, systemic way, so that? more benefits can be extended to the community and people who are affecting, you know. Thank you. 
Thank you. Yes. And I mean, I, I love these questions because I always um, can say that I, I, of course, don't have the answer to that, not being familiar with the health system in Pakistan. But what what we were, um, were trying to convey in using the systems thinking process is that what you're suggesting is absolutely the right approach, is to bring kind of this uh, shared visualization of how your primary health systems are working, what services are being delivered, what would be needed for an HPV-based screening or vaccination program, and how can you integrate those activities together to be more efficient um, with the utilization of resources? So I think that's an absolutely good approach. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Gravett, for your excellent presentation. And with this, we come to the end of our first technical session. Uh, we will begin our technical session uh, at 2 o'clock in this auditorium. Um, meanwhile, uh, between this break, uh, you can go for the lunch and for the prayers, please. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining back. So our next speaker is Professor Dr. Murat uh, Gul Guldekin. He's the Vice President of European Society of Gynecological Oncology in Turkey. Um, he's a, um, he's a Associate Professor and lately a government official who is actively involved in several leading cancer organizations, such as Council Member of the European Society of Gynecological Oncology and the International Agency for Research on Cancer, as well as a board member of the Middle East Cancer Consortium, Black Sea Countries Coalition on Breast and Cervical Carcinoma, Women Against Cervical Cancer, Asian Pacific Organization for Cancer Prevention, and Asian National Cancer Center Alliance. So, Dr. Murat. Good morning, dear friends. I hope my voice is clear and my slides are visible from your side. Yes. So uh, today, first of all, let me to thank you to our dear friends from Pakistan for this nice invitation. Our sister society, IPVS, of course, I have learned personally a lot from them. Who is changing the slides? I'm not sure, it's not me. Is somebody playing with the slides? Let me to share. Can you see my slides? Yes. Who is uh, switching the slides? Strange. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. My dear friends, I will now talk about HPV DNA screening. Uh, so I was, I was thanking to IPVS Society uh, and our Pakistani colleagues for this nice invitation. Today, I will try to share you uh, some our latest uh, evidence, latest publications on cancer screening. And of course, then I will move to the Turkish program, show what we have done until now. So this is the ESGO Prevention Committee. Uh, we are usually doing gynae oncology, but... Uh, prevention from the prevention side, we have collected the most famous epidemiologists of Europe, uh, including Mark, Elmar, Maria, Jarit. And we are just trying to, to help gynae oncologists, especially in this area, who's trying to do something for their countries. There are dozens of questions coming from our patients, from our members. What is screening? What is the vaccination? What's the latest evidence? Uh, and as you can see, uh, together with IPVS, with ESGO, EFC, WHO, we are just trying to give you the best answers with the evidence-based uh, 
uh, guidelines, uh, what is the current situation. So you know, already know the WHO cervical cancer program, and today we will discuss about the screening and the target is 70%, which is really difficult. Mm -hmm. What WHO says that uh, until 2030, all countries should move to HPV DNA from pap smear. So pap smear is not useful anymore. It's really game over for many of the countries. And from now on, we will move about to HPV DNA testing. And the dates for this, the last date is 2030. Uh, and what is the suggestion is to start at age 30 and to do at least two times in life. One, and in, in when the lady is 35 and when the lady is 45 years old. Uh, of course, with your economical situation, you can do more frequently. You can start at an early age. So this is the situation in Europe. As you see day by day, many other countries, many more countries are moving to HPV DNA from pap smear. And this is the work what ESGO Prevention Group is working on. And globally, if you look to the whole world again, similarly, many, uh, the, the number of the countries switching to HPV DNA is, is increasing day by day. Of course, it's reasonable. Um, uh, Turkey was one of the first developing country by 2014, we have implemented HPV DNA. There are some scientific problems. This is especially for Western world, developed world. Uh, pap smear is, I told you, cannot be uh, done in a more in a, in, in, in long term. Uh, the, the system is really uh, is really tiring uh, for the ministries. Sensitivity is low. You go to a village and you can only detect sixty percent of the cancer cases. Post negatives are a lot high. Reproducibility is very low. Pap smear is normal in one city. Maybe it is uh, ASCUS in another city. Uh, my dear friends, my slides are moving itself. I'm not sure who is moving these slides, but let me to make this presentation in this way. Uh, okay. So uh, in many of the countries, it also has uh, organizational problems. In our countries, it's not the only the scientific problems, but the organizational problems, especially uh, for example, in our country, we never have sufficient amount of pathologists uh, showing that uh, looking to thousands and millions of ladies, uh, pap smears, uh, and giving the results timely. Of course, there is also no quotations. So like Turkey, like Pakistan, like India, where 100 million and more people is living, where the target population is really high, uh, pap smear cannot be affordable with the existing uh, with the existing uh, uh, manpower uh, numbers. And HPV DNA, actually, my friends, is not something new. Uh, actually, there are 20 years of research behind. There are lots of trials in different countries, eight years follow-up of more than 200,000 people. And all these trials have clearly showed that it's a very objective test. Sensitivity is very high. False negativity is very low. It can be really automated. It can be centralized. Whereas has a very important manpower advantage. Uh, so you don't need thousands and thousands of cytopathologists. And even these tests can be done in a self way. Uh, this is the meta-analysis done by very important uh, European epidemiologist showing clearly that uh, the physician taken samples do work similarly compared to the uh, patient taken samples. So it can be done in a self-test manner. So based on all of these trials, many European uh, guidelines, including ESGO uh, and uh, American guidelines have been updated. And currently it is the only HPV DNA that's primarily suggested for screening. And if you look to the latest efficacy data, it is still the same. As you can see, sensitivity is around 47% more. What it means that, what it means that it is uh, really very clear that uh, you go now to a village and you can detect not 60%, but 97% of the cancers. And uh, this is also uh, very important when the risk of the cancer, if you look, if you are HPV DNA negative, the risk is five times less than 
compared to a pap smear negative uh, person. But of course, my dear friends, we cannot use all HPV tests. We can only use some, some sorts of validated tests. And it's here, uh, I will show you our uh, latest article about that. Here, you can see it is published in Clinical Microbiology and Infection. And you can only use these 14 uh, HPV DNA tests for cancer screening. So not all tests are suitable, acceptable for national programs. So uh, I told you, especially in conservative countries like Turkey and Pakistan, self-tests are very important. If you look here uh, in the self-tests uh, we did in the ESGO, uh, a very recent systematic review, and it's showing uh, that uh, these tests, if you use PCR, not signal amplification, but clinically validated PCR tests all work very well. Sensitivity and specificity is same compared to doctor and physician taken samples. So my dear friends, towards the end of my uh, presentation, I want to move to the Turkish program. Of course, uh, uh, it's really challenging for many countries uh, can we really be successful or not? Can any developing country like Turkey do this? My dear friends, my brothers, please do not be afraid. We started this HPV DNA in 2014. And here are the articles that you can read more about Turkish uh, program. But I want you to please watch these YouTube videos especially because these videos uh, shows you a lot of what, what's done in Turkey. I will show you mega HPV laboratory video, but please also go to how we teach the GPs and nurses online and how an eHPV application on the cell phones do work. All the doctors and all the patients have their results. So this is the Turkish program. And if you see until 2014, six years ago, we were using Pepsimir and the coverage was only 5%. Of course, we did not have sufficient cytopathologist and quality assurance is really, was really poor. After 2014, we did an outsource tendering. Outsource tendering means that we have a company and we do pay per patient, not per each device or per each kit, but everything is included as a service and you pay per patient. And the new screening program again was starting age 30. You know, HPV is transient below age 30. And cervical cancer is almost zero in our countries below age 30. And what we do, we get two samples from the patients. The first sample is HPV, and the second sample is conventional, pap smear. All these samples do come to central laboratory in Ankara, I will show you. Then we first look if the lady is HPV positive or negative. Very nice, uh, positivity rate is low in Turkey. So if the patient is negative, then we say, okay, you are fine, come five years later. But uh, if she is positive, then we look to genotyping and the, the second uh, sample, which is a conventional pap smear. All patients who are HPV 16 or 18 or pap smear is abnormal is referred to colposcopy. So very shortly, we go to average, HPV positivity is 5%. So 95%, you say, okay, come five years later. In the positive five cases, we look if she's 16 or 18, or if her pap smear is abnormal, these patients is around 2%, 1.6. So you go to average and only 1.6% is referred, is referred to the colposcopy. And of course, all the digital images of these pap smears are still stored. My dear friends, uh, can you see my video? Yes. Okay, so this is the Turkish laboratory. And as you can see, only 30 people is now working there for the whole country around 100 million population. The capacity is around eight to 10,000 patients per day. It is called a mega laboratory, but actually it's not. It's just six rooms here in floor, second floor, 
the six rooms is HBB National Laboratory established there. Of course, like all laboratories, we have national and international quality control of the laboratory. And here you can see, these are the samples coming from the GPs all around the country. All the samples do come to this laboratory every day by cargo. We have a very special uh, software done by the company. And uh, here you can see step by step, the GP is sampled, sample is at cargo, cargo at arrival, and then the sample is at hybrid capture. The sample is negative, the sample is positive and sent to the genotyping. So if everything is yellow or green, no problem. The company here and our ministry promises to give the result in 10 days. So you can really reassure that everything is smooth in the laboratory. You can see these samples. From each patient, we get one HPV and one conventional pap smear. Of course, a barcoding system is very important. You are talking about a 100 million population and you should not mix one sample of a patient with another. And in that case, if the technician makes an error, the computer really do not let it. Now we have taken and registered all these samples. I told you, we will not look pap smears if the lady is HPV negative. So for this reason, we will first look to do HPV samples and see if she is HPV positive or negative. Here, HPV DNAs are open, and meanwhile, pap smears are waiting. We, in the tender, we set uh, internationally uh, accredited uh, HPV companies can enter the tender, and it was hybrid capture group who got this tender in Turkey. Now, of course, for HPV DNA, you need DNA extraction, water baths, but we will look if she is positive or negative. Remember, the positivity rates of HPV was around 5%. I just want to underline these machines. We have five machines giving 10,000 capacity per day. If more patients do come, then you put another machine, six or seven. It's an automated system, and the result is given in eight hours. You can see the machines serially working. I told you, more patients will come, more patient, uh, machines will be implemented. Now, the laboratory technician is getting the results. And you can see that two patients are HPV positive. And we will now look to the genotypes of these patients. The others are clear. And pap smears of these two patients. All these pap smears are evaluated by two cytopathologists. So a quality control exists there and the digital pictures are stored. I show you here. Here you can see the abnormal cells in the pap smear pool. So once the laboratory chief accepts and agrees, approves, the result is at the GP and the result is at the cell phone of the patient saying that you are HPV positive your genotype is this, and your pap smear is this. All these positives are stored for five years and open for joint research theater. But if you are negative, we wait for three months, and after three months, of course, we will use them after recycling. So, my dear friends, this is what's going on in the Turkish program. Uh, and what happened in Turkey, you can see a 10 times increase. It was around 5% and a 10 times increase in the coverage rates is evident after HPV. We have a software. We can make instant monitorization city by city, GP by GP. How many patients are invited? How many did come and give a result? What is the HPV positivity in different parts of the country? What I can say you that we have a 5% HPV positivity all around the country. 
Uh, colposcopy referral rate is 1.6%, and uh, the coverage rates, including the, the, the opportunistic SMAN, is around 90%. Of course, we do publications, I told you, and uh, we have a new, uh, new data, sharing our data with the literature with, uh, for the uh, broader countries and the shared scientific evidences. And I see here in Turkey that HPV 33 is also a very important HPV, like 16. Look at the positive predictivity for CIN2 plus, uh, even, uh, even more than HPV 16. Maybe in our country, HPV 33, these patients should also be referred for colposcopy in the future. And this is another new Turkish data showing me that uh, the gynecologist needs really uh, very important colposcopy training. You know, HPV, if you use a good triage test, uh, if you don't use a triage test, may, may produce uh, a colposcopy to tsunami. This is not the case in Turkey. We generally refer 1.6%, but unfortunately, many of the gynecologists do colposcopy for all HPV positive cases. It's not only unnecessary colposcopy. And again, if you can see here, in many of these unnecessary, not needed colposcopies, our gynecologists do sample with punch biopsies at least two times in 70% of the cases. But, the, but at the treatment point, we are really fine. We usually do not use any surgical treatment like big surgeries like sterectomy, for CIN1, for CIN2, and even for CIN3. So it's, we are good in treatment, but we need more training in colposcopy. And of course, it's not only the colposcopic performance, we also need HPV vaccine. It is not still under discussion and we could never start the vaccination. But when you start HPV DNA, ladies do ask, how can I prevent HPV from my daughter or my sister in the home? And then you will need some, some vaccination programs. And I am definitely sure we will need some septas, and these septas will be very nice uh, in our country, in Pakistani country. My dear friends, this is IPVS uh, logo. I want to thank to them and our colleagues once again. We are always open to share what we have in our hands. You can every time visit Turkey and have a look at this laboratory. And I hope all the message is uh, clear for all of you and the presentation was fine and uh, fruitful for you. Thank you very much, my dear friends. Thank you very much, Dr. Murad. Uh, we might have a few questions. So sir, there's a question from Ms. Sanya, who is saying, who is responsible for still surviving from polio and couldn't eradicate it? I think she's trying to ask why polio has not been eradicated yet in Pakistan. Uh, polio eradication, uh, if, the, if I am right, if the question is that, is already done in, in, in Turkey. It's done many, many years ago. Uh, it's again done by GPs. At that time, it was compulsory uh, to go to vaccination. There was big punishments if you were not uh, having vaccines. Uh, currently, we don't have polio cases. But similarly, in cancer, now uh, it's time to fight with chronic diseases. We ask GPs to invite them for screening. But the, uh, for cancer screening, there is no punishment as we did in uh, polio. Uh, so, uh, but there is positive things. If, if you screen 70%, 70 coverage, then you have some extra money from, from the government. Right, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Murad. So our next speaker is Professor Dr. Suzanne Garland, who's the Director of Center of Women Infectious Diseases Research in Australia. Professor Garland has been instrumental in the evaluation of the efficacy and rollout of vaccines against human papillomavirus, which causes cervical cancer. These vaccines are now being used across the world to prevent cervical cancer. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Suzanne Garland for joining us today. Okay, thank you very, very much for having me. And I'm sorry, 
I've had laryngitis, so my, my throat may um, give up. So what I've been asked to talk about is how to achieve cervical cancer elimination from the Australian perspective. What I'm going to do is really start with my summary slide because this really gives you all the key points. And then I'm going to give you some specific data for each one of these points. And I, I do this in particular for countries like Pakistan or um, Turkey that are just considering vaccination. You really need government support. And it, that's not just only for the finances. This is also for policy, leadership, implementation and sustainability. And in a sense, that touches on a lot of the things that Paddy Gravett was saying earlier in um, developing the program. One thing we found that was really important was having trained vaccinators. Uh, we had nurses who had done courses on how to give a vaccine, how to deal with fears that a participant may have or any um, management of potential adverse events. Appropriate messaging, so, <coughs> excuse me, education of parents, of adolescents, of medical practitioners is vital that um, it, that's done right up front and it clearly has to be culturally appropriate. And bear in mind, for example, in my country, um, a half of the people um, today, their parents come from a country that is not Australia. So we have a lot of uh, different languages to deal with. And clearly the appropriateness of the culture is all, it also needs to be taken into account. Adverse event system, uh, something I would advise, have a system in place should an adverse event occur. And in fact, we were lucky that uh, in Victoria, where I come from, we had what's called Safe Vic, which was a program that was set up for any, any um, person having a vaccine that had a potential problem could actually go to an independent pediatrician infectious diseases physician and be assessed to see whether in fact it was related or not to um, the vaccine. It doesn't, because it, something happened at the same time, doesn't necessarily mean causality. It could be coincidence. And we, in fact, in our first, uh, re, first uh, rollout of vaccine had what was known as a mass psychogenic event, where a lot of young girls fainted and were taken to emergency rooms. But it was more about the girls being lined up, each one seeing the other being vaccinated, no curtain in between, and then a mass psychogenic event. So having some sort of system in place um, that acts responsibly and rapidly is really key. And I give you an example, uh, for example, uh, in Japan, where there was um, an adverse event reported by the press and actually stopped the whole vaccine program despite good coverage for over eight years. So really important to have um, an adverse event system uh, in place. Delivery, um, it can be in schools, it can be in uh, individual clinics. We in Australia adopted schools and really I'll show you in a moment the high coverage in both males and females and it cuts across all the socioeconomic areas too, so it results in equity. Having some surveillance is really important um, to, you know, if the government has just spent a lot of money on a vaccine program, they want to see that the program has been worthwhile. And what we have is a national immunisation program and a national cancer screening register. So we can give outcomes for cancer, for SIN3, genital warts, recurrent respiratory papillomatosis, HPV infection. Um, so that becomes important. What I'm going to show you are results from my country, but just bear in mind, not one size fits all. You have to develop what are your own needs. And what I'm focusing on here today 
and I think you've heard this um, previously many times, the 1970-90 pillars um, for the global strategy to eliminate cervical cancer as a public health issue, meaning uh, making cervix cancer a rare entity. And what I'm going to focus on here is the uh, first pillar, that of vaccination. And we, you know, what you could ask yourselves, well, why is WHO doing this? Why are they looking to achieve uh, cervical cancer elimination? Well, we do have the tools to interrupt natural transmission. And you've seen this um, graph multiple times too. I can get my pointer. Uh, where HPV infection is after sexual taboo. Precancers, or SIN3, happen um, around the late uh, 20s to 30s, and cancer takes multiple decades to happen thereafter. Um, so we have, therefore, primary prevention with vaccines to young girls, but it has to be at high coverage. The screening, as you've just heard from the previous speakers, you need high precision assays such as HPV DNA or RNA tests. And clearly, if you go to find lesions, you have to have a system whereby you can treat the women with the lesions. And I'll just remind you, having listened to the uh, lovely talk on hepatitis B and C, the principles of infectious diseases what are we doing here with vaccination and screening? Well, think about it. HPV infection is really common. Most people get it at some stage after sexual debut. And then sometime later, SIN3, the pre-cancer lesion, the true precursor lesion, will occur in some of those who have chronic infection. And then neoplasia happens in a proportion of those who are and not treated, <coughs> excuse me. So what does HPV vaccination do? Well, it reduces, you really shrink down the viral infection in the community that's circulating and consequently the disease, the SIN3 and the cancers. And really in communicating HPV vaccination to the community, we need to destigmatize the whole area uh, we're trying to interrupt transmission risk to disease. And I put this in to give you an idea. Australia is a big country, but if you look at population, we're about a tenth of what you are here in Pakistan. And we have had a big impact on where cancer, cervix cancer is from, um, it's actually 14th rather than third in Pakistan. And I'll, I'll go through some of the reasons for this in a moment. And we used to have pap screen from 18 to 20 to 69 year olds and compliance was okay, about 65% every two years. <coughs> in Pakistan, I understand it's in the order of 2% of women uh, screened. This is what we, we found in Australia. We organized screening prior to then although pap screening occurred the, it was very opportunistic and if you look at incidence or mortality there was not much impact until it was organized and the higher coverage happened but you can see then it plateaued um, and that's because it's the 1928 test and really you need more sensitive assay. It worked because it was being done every few years. Now, what we've done subsequently in Australia is introduce DNA testing to, to the older age group, in other words, 25 to 70 year olds as the rest of the world. And it's five yearly uh, primary HPV with partial genotyping and reflex cytology for those that are positive for 16 and 18. As well, we introduced vaccination <coughs> excuse me, in 2007. At the time, the only licensed vaccine was the quadrivalent vaccine. So targeted to 6, 11, 16 and 18. And then uh, we had a two year catch up 
time to 2009, up to 26 years of age. Remember that point because that describes why we saw what we saw quickly. And you'll see, note here, this is some of the educative materials, good news about cancer and mother-daughter um, targeted. The gender neutral approach was adopted in 2013, again for uh, school age 12 to 13 year old boys and it had a catch up, which was not as extensive. <laughs> and then with data coming out that as long as your two doses were six months apart and, the, the, and because there was non-inferiority in the immune response for two doses versus three doses, um, up to 15 years of age, we then moved to two doses with the nine valent vaccine. <clears throat> and you can see here that in this messaging for young boys, we're now talking about HPV. So I think it's as much how you say it as much as what you say. And parents were given a lot of information about what the HPV was about. So in summary, the program um, is, is pretty much defined here. We started in 2007 with the three dose, four valent, and then we're over to two doses, nine valent. And just to put you in context, now that we're in 2022, vaccine eligible age cohorts of women are now up to 41 years of age. And for males, it's to 24 years of age. So what have we found? Well, because we didn't believe that the government would have a national immunisation program straight away, because um, I remember being around when hepatitis B was being talked about, and it took us 20 years to get that in the infant immunisation program. So we developed um, some genome prevalence surveillance. So this is all in blue. This is pre-vaccination program. And you can see carriage of any HPV. This is based on, <coughs> excuse me, PCR-based assays. <clears throat> if you go down here to the vaccine types, 15% of young women between 18 and 35, and I should say this was very much age stratified, being higher the younger they were, but 15% overall had 6, 11, or 16, 18. Now, you can see in the burgundy colour, this is nine years after our vaccination program, and you can see that there's a big reduction in the vaccine type HPVs. Now, that remember, the immunity that develops from the VLPs in the vaccine are type-specific largely. And therefore, we see this 70% relative reduction. Um, so quite dramatic. <coughs> if we age stratify this, um, you'll note that in the younger age group, so there'll be more girls who have never seen the virus compared to the older age group, and you've got a 92% relative reduction. When we looked at those who were uh, not vaccinated and, and the rate of carriage in HPV prior to any program and compared it to those who were unvaccinated or partially vaccinated or fully vaccinated, you'll notice if in the unvaccinated, there's a reduction. And this is due to herd protection. Mind you, if the young girl goes out of the herd, they're not covered. So we don't like to talk about that too loudly, but it clearly it's an advantage. Now, <coughs> if we look at the um, male data, and this is as a result of the female program, um, you can see a big reduction in 6, 11, 16, 18 in the blue in the young males. In other words, those having relationships with young girls who were vaccinated. So again, herd protection effects. If we think about then disease 
uh, with short incubation period, genital warts, very short incubation, six to 12 weeks. And you can see here in the, um, get my cursor on it, vaccination here, and then in the less than 21 year olds, you'll see a marked decline from when we started vaccination in 2007 of, of 93%. So it was sharp and a big reduction. And in blue, 73% in the um, 21 to 30 year olds, but those not vaccine eligible age, no effect in the orange. <laughs> not only in, uh, in females, a reduction in genital warts, but in males as well. <coughs> In fact, we, we we found we couldn't find genital warts to show medical students because we had such a, a rapid decline in the sexual health clinics. And here, that the disease with the next incubation period, that of cervical abnormalities, and this is again stratified into um, age, age groups, age strata. And this is histologically confirmed cervical abnormalities. Not looking at those vaccinated, this is just overall 65% decline in those under 20 and um, 40 and 13 up the age strata. Um, uh, an uncommon or rare but significant morbidity, mortality is juvenile onset recurrent respiratory papillomatosis. And um, a survey was done through pediatrics groups and uh, ENT surgeons. And you can see here from 2012 to 2016, a marked reduction in um, juvenile onset RRP. Uh, and this is really a result of the catch-up program in women because the babies being born to women who uh, were eligible for vaccination um, clearly uh, responded to the vaccine, didn't pass on the uh, virus and caused the RRP in their babies. Now, I mentioned before that, and I don't expect you to read all of this, but the cervical screening pathway has changed in Australia. We've now gone to oncogenic HPV testing with partial genotyping. And those that are 16, 18, uh, then go to have, um, sorry, 16, 18, um, go straight to colposcopy with, together with um, liquid-based cytology. And um, those that were non-16, 18, but basically have this repeated in 12 months based on data we found from our first lot of women coming through um, DNA screening. If there's no HPV detected, they go to routine, routine five-yearly screening. Now, in a sense, why am I showing you this? Well, it gives you a built-in surveillance for um, HPV. So you can see here in A, any oncogenic HPV um, is higher in younger women and then plateaus out with age. And then the non-16-18. And then in the 16-18, uh, remember I showed you before, in young women, it was about 15% positivity. And now we're down to 2%. So it's had a really marked effect, the vaccination in carriage. Now, just to give you a bit of information on, on surveillance, um, and bearing in mind the WHO indicators, I've put these here in italics and the WHO outcomes, and I'll show you some of the um, data we have collected as a big study group called um, C4 with the Center of Research Excellence in Cervical Cancer Control. Now, what we've been able to find, and you can look at this link, it's in the public domain, and you can see here the cervical cancer incidence <coughs> is in the uh, dotted line. Remember that WHO wants to get us down here in the, the black line of 400,000. So we haven't reached it yet. 
But what we can see is that we've got higher rates in the Indigenous communities, uh, double that of the non-Indigenous community. So there's disparity here. You can also see in remoteness and in socioeconomic, uh, there is a, a difference in those that are in remote areas and uh, in poorer areas. So that's cervical cancer incidence. Um, what about detection of high-grade cervical disease? Well, again, if you look, these are bars for age stratified um, by, by um, year. So 2013 to 2016 to 2017. And you can see that in those first uh, few years from vaccination, we've got a reduction that's significant for high-grade cervical disease. It's histologically um, proven. Again, as I just showed you for infection, it's plateaued down to 2%. And there's pretty much equity, whether you're in a remote area or um, in a, a lower socioeconomic group. <coughs> what really underpins these results is vaccine coverage. And you can see here from 2016 to 2019, the slope is going up. So the um, completion by age 15 is, in, is gone just over 80%. And there's a bit of difference in the Indigenous male and females and um, non-Indigenous groups. And there's also a slightly a lower uptake rate in males. So I'll give you this here. This is the most up-to-date data. For girls by age 15, you can see no matter where they've come from, which state or territory, um, it's around 80.2% are completely vaccinated. And um, this is for boys, just a little bit lower, but still a reasonable rate, but not as good as some countries such as Malaysia, as we heard the other night. And so modelling, which uh, really predicts the long-term impacts, um, predicts that we in Australia will get to less than 400,000 in around 2028. And getting to less than one case per 100,000, I guess a lot of us are not going to be here. But um, a big job to do in the long term. So you can ask yourself, well, if we vaccine, if you introduce vaccination in Pakistan, what else do you want to know? Well, what I can tell you is that's the experience in Australia, the global experience is that vaccines are very safe and well tolerated. There's over 500 million doses <laughs> being distributed to date. And adverse events have been monitored very carefully. And I think there's been more review and, and on the, this vaccine, this vaccines, HPV vaccines, than any other vaccine um, gone before it. They're highly immunogenic and they last for at least a decade. And I think there was a question given to Thomas um, in, a, in his earlier talk today about how long do we need to know that these vaccines will last? Well, really, the answer is a little bit like when I was young and hepatitis B was a new um, vaccine, time will tell. And what we do know is that for around 15 years, there is um, still a good neutralising antibodies present and there is no breakthrough disease. So we don't have an immune correlate of protection. So they're effective, and really what we need is therapeutic vaccines, but that's a topic for another day. What I can show you is this Swedish data. We don't have this data for Australia because we don't have the numbers, but basically if you look at unvaccinated women, um, the number of cases of cancer, surface so cancer, if you then look at those vaccinated at 17 to 20, 30 years, Clearly, you'll have some prevalent infection there and disease. And if you look at the those vaccinated much younger, a significant reduction in cervical cancer. 
I'm bearing in mind that uh, most vaccines target 16 and 18, the commonest two uh, viruses causing cancer uh, it globally. There have been some challenges um, and to ask yourself, well, who, who should really be vaccinated? Well, as WHO says, the girls that uh, bear the burden of disease target the nine to 14 year olds um, initially. Vaccine, there has been some vaccine shortage, although that seems to have been rectified by a lot more production by the uh, pharmaceutical companies. Vaccine hesitancy and acceptance I mentioned in my first slide, it's really important that people hear about what the, what the vaccines are about um, and what they, uh, how effective they are, how they prevent cancer. Someone I know also asked a question about doses. What we do know from uh, work done in young, younger um, boys and girls, that if you look at the um, non-inferiority of, vac of, of antibodies, um, it's okay to vaccinate at naught and six month intervals um, rather than three doses. And that's been um, underscored by WHO. What I'm going to come to next is, of course, the latest SAGE um, recommendations on one, uh, one dose as an off-label use. I need to tell you that there are new vaccines coming and some have been pre-qualified already by uh, WHO, the Inovax, and the other Chinese um, vaccine, which are both a two-valent vaccine covering 16, 18. And there's also one about to be pre-qualified by WHO from the Serum Institute of India. We need equity globally, and we've clearly had lots of challenges with the COVID pandemic into the bargain. Now, just to come back to the SAGE report, um, SAGE looked at, um, did a, a, a separate systematic review to look at the immunogenicity, efficacy and effectiveness of sin, single dose vaccination schedules and compared that with no vaccination um, and multi-dose schedules. Uh, I have to say um, that a lot of the uh, studies were observational. There's really only one that is completed and reported for scrutiny. Uh, it's a randomized controlled trial from Kenya. It had a high efficacy of 97.8% in girls up to 20 years of age. <coughs> and on this basis, SAGE made um, a statement that not in 14 year olds, one could use a permissive off-label single dose or two doses, as long as they were six months apart. So that allows for more flexibility and um, I guess sharing out of doses and certainly delivery is a lot easier if it's one dose. So in conclusion, I would like to say that the impact and effectiveness of the HPV vaccines uh, has really been underpinned by high coverage. So that coverage is really important and really the um, vaccines need to be given prior to sexual debut. I've given you some data there of uh, delivery systems, um, either at schools or health clinics or a combination thereof. And we found schools work very well. I've shown you that with high coverage, you can get a reduction in HPV infection, genital warts, CN2+, and juvenile onset RRP. Surveillance and registries are important to document what you find. Um, and I think what is really sobering, if you look at this um, graph that was put out by ICO, um, globally, although 120 countries have endorsed vaccination of the vaccine eligible age girls who completed a course of vaccine, it's only 13%. 
So we really do have huge challenges. Yet we know um, that cervical cancer elimination is a feasible goal because we have the tools and we have a strategy uh, in the three pillars of action. And to get to it, we certainly need government support and leadership. We need infrastructure for delivery. Education and communication are really important, as we've stated earlier. Surveillance to show that vaccination is working. And, uh, and I can't underscore enough the um, make, making sure you've got key opinion leaders um, organised to deal with any sort of hesitancy that may happen and interrupt a program. And, you know, I think we've got to look on the bright side of things. We have lay literacy around vaccines, screening, molecular technology, all from the COVID pandemic. And maybe what we can really be doing is putting all those technicians who've learned PCR um, to focus with their platforms for, for COVID onto HPV. Um, and I think also in the talk given the other night by uh, Yin Ling Wu, we can use information technology in the way we feedback information to uh, participants. And I'd just like to finish off by saying, please come and join and learn more about HPV. Come and join IPV, as the International Papilloma of our society. We were going to have this meeting in Kyoto, but because the, the borders were not open and we had to sign contracts, we had to move this to Washington, D.C., so it's not that far off. It's in April 17 to 21. Please think about it. We do not have any uh, Pakistani doctors, researchers in the society, and we invite you. We'd love to have you there. And bear in mind, there will be scholarships for travel and registration um, through the Gates Foundation. So um, please let us know if you'd like to learn more about clinical, public health and research around HPV. We have a lot on education and advocacy. And clearly, if you're starting off a program, please utilise these up-to-date, well thought out education tools. And if you join, you can join as a, as a, as a team um, and for lower and middle income countries, we do this uh, for 10 US dollars for a group. So I really welcome you to IPVS in April next year. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Susan, for this very informative uh, presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Fazia Asad, who is the country director of Chipaiko uh, in Pakistan. She is a public health specialist with an experience of law and management for over 20 years. She studied medicine from Karachi, had a clinical experience of gyne uh, gynecology and obstetrics, and have proceeded to work in a fast upscale environment of public health in various NGOs. Passionate about women health and system preparedness, the move to development sector was a natural fit for her from technical advisor to director position. She is currently working as a country director uh, at Jipaiko, Pakistan. Dr. Fazia. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum once again. It is indeed a great privilege for me to share with you um, some pieces of our work 
um, in the context of Pakistan for the introduction of HPV vaccine, as well as uh, some uh, treatment perspective of uh, cervical cancer. Uh, the amount of information I'm going to share with all of you is um, supported by the Federal Directorate of Humanization, Islamabad, Pakistan, with the generous support of Gavi Alliance. And definitely, um, we are also working very closely with uh, one of the learning exchange and advocacy platform of CHIC, uh, which is a coalition for a strengthening immunization community. And this is the platform which provides us an opportunity to exchange ideas, to learn from each other. So let's move uh, to the first snapshot. Uh, and that's about the global view. You already he heard about that 120 countries are the one who have successfully introduced HPV vaccine across the globe. But still, a lot many are left, including Pakistan, for the active implementation and introduction of HPV vaccination and the treatment of cervical cancer piece. Cervical cancer is the only women cancer which is preventable by using a vaccine, HPV vaccine. And definitely treatable too if, if we do an active screening from the early time, earlier time, as early as possible. So in this regard, to learn more about the context of Pakistan, what is the current state of affairs? What is the situation in the country regarding the data? How many people in general, as well as the practitioners and the public health professionals, policymakers know about this subject? We did a landscape exercise with the National Ministry of Health and the EPI program, both at the federal and the provincial level. So we did a 69 um, KIIs as well as focus group discussion to get all this information. Um, and uh, starting with some desk work in the form of the national and global literature review, um, and then thematic analysis using WHO new vaccine framework. Uh, we also got an opportunity to work on the costing analysis piece to learn which is the best option for Pakistan to think about the introduction of HPV vaccine in the context of the country and needs of the country. Then uh, to keep everybody on board, uh, we ensured consultation um, and a buy-in of all the concerned stakeholders, including our core partners, WHO, UNICEF, and other extended partners who are working very closely with the National Ministry of Health on the subject of humanization. So if you have a quick look at the initial landscaping of cervical cancer in the country, uh, Pakistan is, as you know, is a medium to high burden country as per global standards. And around 20 women get infected by cervical cancer day, daily, adding to the prevalence. So um, as I told you earlier this morning that the data, we don't have any central registry system in place for the cervical cancer or even for the women's cancer in Pakistan. Whatever is, for, is present in the form of data in country right now at some sentinel sites or at some oncological sites or in the private sector, that's very patchy. But based on that data, if you say like uh, more than 5,000 cases are getting reported in the country annually and out of more, uh, more than 5,000, more than 3,100 uh, of the women are facing mortality just because of this disease, which is preventable, easily preventable by the uh, use and introduction of vaccine on time. So Pakistan is one of the 10 worst countries for female mortality rate just because of this. Uh, it is the second most common female cancer in women of reproductive age and third leading cancer among women of all ages. Even the studies were honestly very hard to find at the time of landscaping. And we found two studies uh, at that time on this subject. One was from southern part of Pakistan, southern part of Punjab, Pakistan, National uh, Medical University, Multan, 
where they did uh, about the occurrence, a study about the occurrence of the cervical cancer and other relevant cancers and found 47% of the ovarian and 25% of the cervical cancer cases prevalence um, based on their uh, gyne ward data. Then there was another study uh, uh, which was done in Karachi, in Civil Hospital Karachi, again a tertiary care teaching hospital in 2019, where they found that 51% of the women were aware of cervical cancer, uh, mostly because um, they were more literate, educated, or came to know through some private practitioner. And then 34% knew about the screening test and 40% women about the HPV vaccine that there is something like this present uh, is present within the system to prevent the, the cases. Now, when you go to specific findings of that landscape exercise, you will find that there is a dire need for a specific communication and advocacy strategy to address this issue because there is a potential stigma related to gender or the sexual health, because there's something which is related with the reproductive system. So a culturally sensitive education needed with professional and the community groups, this is another thing. That's why uh, uh, we have to be a little cautious while uh, coming up with some communication strategy and communicating with the journal people, common layman person, um, informing about of how important it is to prevent uh, them from this cancer. Need for new platforms, uh, then reaching adolescent in and out of a school. Uh, though nine to 14 years is the age where you will find easy access through the school education, higher secondary level education, most of the times. Uh, but definitely some of our population is also out of school. So the best way is to make it a part of the routine immunization work in the form of a life course vaccination. And uh, EPI program has recently reached to the age group of 15 years through a very successful MRI campaign recently in Pakistan. So it is something which is doable by the system, health system, by the program, EPI program uh, in the country. There is evidence of successful interventions in such an age group by them. And build on past experience with new vaccine introductions like uh, Pakistan successfully um, incorporated the implementation of the polio vaccine, uh, uh, rotavirus, uh, and so many others. So, so the program is uh, provides a quite a healthy platform for the introduction of some good vaccines. But this can't be done by alone, the government alone or by some single entity. It should be a joint effort uh, by all the group of the people. And we have to think about some multi-sectoral approach involving the education department, involving media, involving um, religious um, uh, scholars in certain parts of the country. Um, so uh, we have to come up with some smart approach about it. We did a SWOT analysis just to learn about what is the best, uh, what are the strengths, where we need to work more, where are the opportunities and what needs to be taken care of before planning anything. So based on that, there are certain strengths. No doubt, it is very much evident that HPV vaccine introduction can help you in, redu in reducing this mortality rate because of cervical cancer. And definitely provides a good treatment if a screening can be done quite early. So, and definitely going to contribute into overall sustainable development goals and universal health coverage uh, package. Pakistan is now moving and has already entered into the implementation of a universal health coverage package where the government has already committed for the integrated health service provision through primary health care level. So this is not only a strength, but an opportunity for the country to integrate all these evidence-based practices of humanization into the system. Now, at the same point in time, there are certain areas and the gaps where we need a constant effort and attention. 
First of all, we do need a proper policy on the cervical cancer or the women cancer and the guidelines, different SOPs for different things. Then definitely we need a central registry system to come up with the proper data, structured data to define uh, the national prevalence uh, of this cancer to know the disease bur burden actually. And um, it may strain the EPI program, though the EPI program has recently successfully demonstrated their capacity and capability to reach to the adolescent population through their successful uh, MRI campaign. One thing WHO recommendation is always to start with the girls of nine to 14 years, though this vaccine is not only limited for girls, it, it should be, it can be given to the males as well. Screening facilities are not consolidated, not implemented in the country. Unfortunately, even our teaching hospitals, they are not doing this screening exercise, except some of the private practitioners. So we have to emphasize the need. We have to come up with some guidelines or SOPs for ensuring this mandatory screening for women related to the cervical cancer. Then uh, at the time when we were doing this landscape exercise, there was a funding constraint due to COVID-19 pandemic within the government system because all, all the funding and all the resources were diverted for COVID-19 at that time. But everything brings in with them opportunity. So there is an opportunity. It will be very first anti-cancer vaccine for the women in Pakistan if it becomes a part. And let me share at this point that government of Pakistan has already made it a part of their uh, five years uh, uh, plan uh, for immunization, portfolio planning part and uh, committed to introduce it by the end of 2024 or uh, the first half of year 2025. But by then we should be able to come up with some preparation mechanism to prepare our nation, our provinces um, to receive this vaccination and then implement the dosages. Um, it, it will be much cheaper than screening the entire population for cervical cancer because we have a huge population. We are the fifth populous country over this complete world. So if you start screening of the complete female population, it will really be difficult and challenging for the government and the private sector to reach every woman. So the best part is prevention you can inject as a part of the immunization program, all the girls of nine to 14 and all the boys of nine to 14 um, to, to prevent this disastrous disease. High value perception of the vaccine in the medical and civil community is uh, equally an opportunity, but at the same time, we have to, uh, whatever we plan, whatever we design, we have to think that we have uh, a low literacy level as compared to other nations of the world. So uh, we have to ensure that whatever we design and implement that should be acceptable to the communities and the people to avoid any stigma. Uh, the communities may pose barriers because of law, a lack of information, because of lack of awareness and the lack of literacy. The allergy may oppose a new vaccine as promoting. Uh, you, you must have learned about uh, some sort uh, once uh, Pakistan started introduction of iodized salt that was tagged with family planning. So there is a potential of such things in the country. So keeping old previous history in mind, we have to come up with proper advocacy and communication strategy. And it, it, is, it would be important for the girls and their mothers and the parents to make them understand the importance of this thing. So now coming after the landscape, uh, analysis, uh, we did a costing analysis that how much it will cost to the government of Pakistan if they procure this vaccine for the country. And we followed a WHO modeling for this purpose, costing modeling. And uh, this, pro this piece of work was supported by IVAC, uh, which is well known for such uh, costing economics uh, analysis as a partner. So, um, all the parameters and the pillars which were used as cost drivers for the analysis of this costing piece were taken from the existing EPI program cost. 
which includes the operational cost, including the capacity building cost, uh, monitoring cost, uh, their management cost, et cetera. So, and then we added the cost of the vaccines. So uh, altogether, um, there are three types of vaccines available globally. One is Gardasil, other is Cervarex, and the third one uh, just shared by the speaker in uh, her last, uh, in the presentation, uh, that was Cicoline, which is Chinese vaccine, but WHO pre-qualified vaccine. And that is the most cost-effective for the countries like Pakistan, where it costs like 7.8 US dollar per girl for two doses of vaccine to uh, around $12 per two doses of vaccine per girl um, for Cervarex and Gardasil. Uh, so uh, based on uh, the current most recent uh, recommendations of SAGE, which came out in June 2022, regarding the effectiveness, which is more than 98%, even by the use of a single dose instead of going for two doses. Even if we introduce this formula of single dose for the country, that will bring the cost down further to of these vaccines. So this is the single dose uh, data. The SAGE, uh, which is a strategic advisory group of experts, takes care of all the evidence-based uh, researches and, and the policy decisions. Um, they, they went through this exercise and uh, through these different studies starting from 2004, 9, 17, and 18. And then finally decided that every study, every intervention of different countries of the different knock and corners of the world are saying that yes, even a single dose introduction can be effective, nine, more than 98% effective um, uh, to prevent the cervical can cancer amongst the girls and boys. So based on all these evidence-based and research pieces, WHO, um, uh, SAGE, a group on immunization recommendations. Finally, they recommended that one or two doses is scheduled for the primary target of girls aged nine to 14 years old. Then one or two doses is scheduled for young women aged 15 to 20 years old. Then two doses with a six months interval for women over 21 years old, even if somebody gets late and cannot take uh, uh, the dose on time, then even after getting, uh, uh, after 21 years, there is a possibility uh, by providing that prevention through two doses with that six months interval. And in cases of HIV or some immuno immunocompromised conditions, even uh, uh, this vaccine can be given to these patients too. So based on all these pieces of work, Finally, we sat down with the provincial and the national government and had series of consultations to come up with this strategy, the roadmap to introduce HPV and to start working on the cervical cancer. And some of the salient features and, and the buy-in which came out of this exercise are build a comprehensive national policy on cervical cancer elimination and situate HPV vaccination within the broader context. So the country will have to come up with some comprehensive national policy on this, some SOPs, some guidelines to drive this whole thing among the professionals, among academia, among different type of stakeholders. And then as most, uh, some of our population is out of school and some are going to school. So we might have to come to one or two different approaches. For school, it can be given through schools and for out of school kids, it can be made a part of a routine immunization or can be given through a campaign mode. Expanded estimation of disease burden and that's only be possible through a central registry system. Inclusion of HPV vaccine into national and provincial immunization planning to make it a part of a life course vaccination. Advocacy and awareness raising with all the stakeholders, including professional bodies, which includes Pakistan Medical Association, Society of Herbs and Gynae Pakistan, Pakistan Pediatric Association, 
um, all our academic institutions. Um, uh, so uh, there's a long list of stakeholders who need to be taken on board on this subject. Then capacity building of the medical professionals themselves, because honestly, during the landscape exercise, what we have seen and found that some of rather most of the professionals were not very much aware about, about this disease and the way it can be prevented and treated. Position HPV vaccine introduction within broader system is strengthening and resourcing of the immunization program. And the best way is to make it a part of the universal health coverage package to make it a part of integrated health services, which already a priority area of the government of Pakistan. So these are some of the important milestones which we have achieved as a country, as a nation, as a Pakistani nation. Um, and I think now on we have to move ahead uh, with some of the groundwork to shape up the strategy for the proper implementation of the introduction of HPV. And awareness and advocacy is the very first step where we are today with you. And really, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to request every one of you to please start talking about this subject amongst yourself, within your academia, without your institutions, without, uh, within your uh, uh, siblings, within, uh, within your peer group, so that everybody can be aware of uh, this thing, which is preventable, which is treatable, if taken care uh, at correct time and course of life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Fazia, for your very informative and important talk. So with, th with this, we come to our Q&A session. So if anyone from the audience has any questions to our speakers, you may ask now, please. Actually, I would have a question to Faust here. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned uh, in the beginning of your talk that 40% of women knew about the HPV vaccine. And as we discussed a lot about this, topic being a taboo and so how do you explain it yes okay yeah so during the landscape exercise uh, uh, we found some cervical cancer survivors actually who really suffered from this disease and then uh, got treated successfully by uh, their practitioners by the private sector providers and at the same point in time, they created awareness within their family members. They immediately uh, uh, provide family with the prevention part and uh, provided injections to their kids, both the male and females in most of the cases. So, uh, so that was uh, something very surprised for us because we were expecting that it is I mean, hardly we will find anyone, but like 40% of the people, they were aware from the general public as well as some private sector providers were very aware as compared to the public sector. And the main reason which we found is that they attended international conferences, pre-conferences, they were part of hands-on training. So it was something uh, which was internalized by them. And they wanted to collect the data. They wanted to do the screening exercise. Uh, some were doing, doing the data collection exercise for the research purpose. That was their interest. Some were uh, doing um, this. Uh, they were providing and adding this facility as a private sector provider just to engage more clients for this service. So, so that's why you are seeing the number of 40%. I have a question, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, you mentioned about these vaccines, three vaccines. First of all, I want to ask that which vaccine is available in Pakistan? And are these vaccines available in government hospitals like malaria and TB centers? Are patients should purchase them? And some 
uh, centers, where are these vaccines available? Thank you. So there are actually three types of vaccine which are uh, in use globally. One is Gardasil, other is Cervarex, and third is Sicoline, which is a Chinese make. And unfortunately, if <laughs> of, uh, today you asked me, there is no vaccine available in the market for the cervical cancer. Why? Because there was no demand at all in the market for this subject. That's why uh, initially when Merck and Cyril brought in few amount, number of amount of vaccines in the system, they retrieved it because of less demand. So that was the reason. So I think we need more awareness, more demand generation, and then simultaneously working on the supply side also. And that would only be possible if we can come up with some integrated model. Yeah. Uh, diagnostic centers available? In yeah, Karachi all, all your tertiary, uh, like even Chotai, the secondary. Like Chotai and Chokathanam, they are doing the diagnostic tests? Yes, they are. If if uh, some secondary or a tertiary or teaching level hospital uh, uh, do the sampling, um, unfortunately, uh, not all. Some of the hospitals they are doing screening through Pap smear or VIA use, uh, but not all. Um, I know the Sin province because there the minister has notified all the hospitals and all the health facilities for the mandatory screening of HPV. Uh, of the cervical cancer. Uh, but in true implementation, it will take time, honestly. So some of the hospitals are doing. Um, during my recent visit to Karachi, I found that most of the private sector teaching hospitals um, in Karachi, they are encouraging patients for screening and they are doing this screening piece. Yeah. Thank you. There, there is a question in the chat about herd protection. If I could answer, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, please. Yes, um, somebody's asking and, you, and using the parallel of COVID-19 and HPV and that Sweden decided to allow herd protection by vaccinating um, a high proportion of the community. I mean, HPV is a very different virus. It's stable and um, it doesn't change like the flu virus or COVID does. Um, and you don't want to rely on, it's not really herd immunity, it's herd protection. In other words, whilst you stay in the herd, you're protected um, from those around you. But if you go outside of the herd and, and considering that HPV genital infection is picked up largely sexually, um, if someone travels to another another country where there's no vaccination, they may have been protected in their own community, but they will not be protected if they're not vaccinated when they go outside of the herd. I hope that's clear. Thank you, Dr. Susan. Uh, thank you. My name is Dr. Ashit. Uh, I have a question and. Uh, I actually had a question with uh, Dr. Murat, who, were, who was presenting from Turkey, but uh, as he's not here, so I can ask the chair as well. Uh, he said that they are doing the mandatory testing for HPV, uh, for screening, HPV screening, but they do not offer vaccine. So I, I think if they do a good cost benefit analysis, testing is non mandatory. I think vaccination is more important to do. Uh, just doing the testing and uh, like, uh, uh, but but Dr. Ifter, you can like uh, uh, respond to that. Another thing, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Ifter, that uh, Dr. Fazia also mentioned that in countries like Pakistan, we there cannot do mask screening of uh, HPV or cervical for for uh, cervical cancer. Uh, can we do visual testing for the initial phase and offer vaccine? Would that be a good uh, combination to for elimination of uh, cervical cancer, or we should also enhance the testing procedures or PCR testing or other uh, uh, other tests which can be conducted? Uh, what the interventional techniques say? Thank you. 
So with regard to your question about Turkey, uh, they have mandatory screening, as you said, but the coverage of the population is quite low, actually. Uh, so I think Murat mentioned once it's five to seven million or so, not more. It's a total population. And uh, clearly, in my opinion, but everybody can actually make a statement by its own. I mean, uh, uh, screening and uh, vaccination has to go hand in hand. And, you know, uh, to set up a screening program um, on the with a frequent screening, you know, of women starting at the age not before 30, actually, you should not uh, do that, uh, and then go on is very costly and is a lot of effort. And uh, but I think the WHO has proposed a, a wonderful alternative here. I mean, because uh, screening twice in a lifetime for everybody uh, would really help out, and uh, and the costs are reasonable. Yes, that's what I think would be a good idea, actually, to to establish a um, really um, vaccination program, school-based vaccination program, mostly, uh, where you get a lot of uh, young girls uh, and later on maybe also boys, because it's not about cervical cancer, also oropharyngeal cancer is caused by HPV, and this is a quite uh, frequent cancer, actually, as I learned. So to cover uh, as much as possible uh, uh, girls and boys and then do uh, twice a lifetime at least. I mean, and if one can afford to pay by, out of his own pocket or her own pocket, you know, to get more screening, it's fine. But I mean, to, to covered by government at least twice a lifetime. Yeah, thanks. Hello. So there is another question from Zahidullah, why Pakistan has no testing for HPV and no vaccination at the national level? Yes, Zahid. I think it will take a little bit more time, uh, honestly, because um, when we talk about the testing, um, it requires the capacity building and reaching to the uh, uh, eligible group population. So uh, reaching to the eligible population can be through the fixed facilities where they do need the capacity building on the screening exercise or the testing exercise. And at the same point in time, we have to think about the task sharing and the task shifting concept uh, to our mid-level service providers like the lady health work uh, visitors or uh, community midwives who are sitting within the communities uh, as the first point of contact with the people over there. So um, these are the some of the strategies we have to think about at the introduction of the HPV vaccine because it's just in a very initial phase and everything will have to start on the ground. Uh, so once the vaccine will be here, uh, hoping uh, by by the early 2025, then definitely the vaccination will start maybe from one province first or maybe at the national level. Hello, ma'am here. Yeah, please. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, I am Pavan Kumar from Sindh, Amar Kot Sindh. Uh, my question is from you, the what type of initial measures are uh, steps taken by the government of Pakistan for the HPV? Are we waiting for the outburst of HPV? Are uh, primarily measures taken by the government of Pakistan for the HPV? Yeah. Okay, uh, some of the steps I can share with you, which the government of Pakistan has planned for the introduction of HPV. First of all, um, there is an immunization uh, piece of work which we call uh, full portfolio planning, which you can call a five years planning by the government, which is mostly done with the cost piece. So um, a government of Pakistan has shown its commitment to make it a part of the full portfolio planning exercise, which is a great entry point of this subject for the health systems. That shows the commitment of Pakistan. Yes, government wants to work on this subject, on HPV <clears> introduction, <throat> and at the same point in time, hands and hands on the screening uh, against this. Um, then the second important thing is to uh, consolidate the data at one place. And there, the government needs support for the development of the central registry system. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you the example of, of the place from where you belong, Sindh. So the Minister of Health and Population, uh, so Dr. Azra, uh, so Pichoho, so she is 
quite an inspirational leader and she immediately um, based on these findings and the roadmap uh, work she immediately assigned a task force for this purpose um, so they, now we have a synth task force on hpv and cervical cancer uh, and we we had a meeting and we are constantly doing it on quarterly basis to come up with some of the SOPs and guidelines um, at the provincial level. Uh, starting, sometimes it, it, it's become necessary, honestly, for the introduction of something new to start with a small scale or from one province or the two province and then scaled it up across at the national level. So SIN proactively offered this thing and they formed a technical working group for the task force for this purpose. And some of the TORs of the task force is to come up with some of the guidelines and the SOPs uh, around and coming up with the advocacy strategy and the communication strategy. Um, and to see whether do we need some sort of operational research to decide to decide the modality of introduction, whether we should go through a school program uh, and or, or to through a routine immunization. Even minister was of the view there is a school uh, a program already in place uh, within within the province of Sin, but she wants a revamping of uh, that school's education program in a in, to make it more integrated one. And cervical awareness and education around cervical cancer will be part of this integrated approach through this revamping of the school education program. So these are some of the critical steps already decided by the government of SIN. And definitely these are in the priority areas of uh, 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 the national government uh, directorate of uh, EPI as well, uh, based in Islamabad. So these are some of the quick steps already taken by the government. Please. Thank you, Dr. Fozia. Uh, it was a very nice presentation. Many things already you have covered. And uh, I would like to know and uh, rather suggest, you know, because you have been actively working through Jupaigo in all Pakistan in COVID as well. You are doing a great job, I know that. And uh, there was a big problem during uh, COVID. Beside a uh, threat, it was opportunity as well to improve health system. Similarly, infections like HPV and other, uh, which have a big issue and a problem for our population, and for the world as well. In my opinion, if you suggest government, like federal government and uh, wherever you are interacting, like uh, provincial health departments, secretaries, they can allocate resources for screening, just like SIN, if they have done it, it can replicate it to other provinces as well. And if you will recommend it at federal government level, I think so they can allocate resources if you will get the screening, it will help to give data to, you know, uh, convince legislators, lawmakers, uh, fundraisers, and uh, NGOs, international organizations, then to allocate enough money for vaccination as well and development of vaccines and use of vaccines. And this will also help to reduce the, you know, resistance of uh, which we are facing, you know, while uh, vaccinating people. So this was a comment and- uh, No, thank you very thank much. You. I think that was very beneficial. Just to add here, um, as per your discussion, uh, uh, we have a technical working group on self-care. And as most of you must be uh, knowledgeable about WHO uh, recommendations of the self-care. So there is one recommendation about cervical cancer as well where WHO recommends the self-evaluation um, or self-assessment of the cervical cancer by the women herself. As uh, there is one product of family planning, uh, injectable contraceptive DMPSC subcutaneous, which can uh, women can take three months injectable contraceptive by herself subcutaneously. So in the same way, she can do the self 
um, uh, you know, testing of the cervical cancer while sitting at home. So this is the next level of discussion, um, which can be generated and which will be generated by us um, during that technical working group session, uh, which is already in place at the federal level with the National Ministry of Health um, on self-care. So there are multiple opportunities where we can advocate and, uh, you know, make a case uh, for cervical cancer. Um, then I would have um, a question if you could elaborate a little bit on this self uh, testing for uh, cervical cancer. But before I would also add some recommendation because I mean, we are also talking about screening in the rural areas. Yes. And for this, I think we need pilot projects uh, to really find out uh, how you can do that. And then to talk to everybody there, the stakeholders, grassroots workers, and if this is manageable and how it's manageable, you know? Yeah. Okay, so can you? Yeah. Say a little so, bit more about this. Yeah. Uh, so your question um, around that technical. So there is another task force or a technical working group at the federal level uh, where we have representatives from Department of Health, Department of Population Welfare, different donor community, as well as WHO and partner like Japaigo. And that is meant for self-care. So uh, as you see the recent uh, guidelines of WHO and self-care that includes multiple things. Uh, self-care involves the antenatal checkups. That includes a uh, family planning option. That includes uh, the assessment uh, around STIs that say there are certain set of um, symptoms which uh, if a woman suffers can do this and this uh, for, for her uh, protection. So um, likewise, there is one recommendation on cervical cancer as well. So once we talk about an integrated approach, it is an opportunity to create a voice around HPV and cervical cancer screening at this platform as well. So that's a federal level. That's more around policymakers and decision makers um, to create awareness about this subject amongst themselves as well. Yeah. And now your uh, next uh, uh, comment around out uh, about reaching to the rural population and hard to reach areas, very true, that's very important. And we have a very strong presence of a lady health workers program in Pakistan, which is available at every knock and corner. They are already involved in polio and so many other tasks given to them by the government. And even they did a brilliant job during the COVID crisis. Um, I mean, it's, it's uh, awareness can be created straightforward through them by educating them and building their capacity and equipping them with some of the IC material on this subject. <clears throat> um, at the same point in time, they can work as a, uh, as a connecting point uh, to the referral site for screening and HPV prevention as through injections. Thank you very much. Uh, with this, we come to the concluding session of today's event. I would like to invite His Excellency Professor Dr. Mohammad Iqbal Chaudhry, Coordinator General Comstech, for his closing remarks. and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, see, this uh, event of today was extremely meaningful. So very unlike of Comstock event was not only really very large uh, with uh, 300 people sitting in this auditorium, but certainly very high quality people who I'm sure that have benefited from uh, the deliberation, discussions, lectures of some very prominent people. I can say very safely that in, in the field of HPV, the best among the best were either present physically uh, Professor Thomas Ifna, or gave this like gave their lectures through online. So you were exposed to the best of science in the context of HPV, and of course uh, with the addition of uh, a very uh, dear friend Professor Dr. Rasim Jafri, and an active player in this field, Dr. Fazia, we have made uh, a holistic uh, overview of this very important field. Uh, as we know that most of the cancers are idiopathic, you know, the reasons are not known and you're bewildered why and how and why me and this happened. But cervical cancer is one of the cancers in which 
causes are not known and in that case you know 80 90 percent of cervical cancer and they would confirm are related to hpv infection and if we cannot really avoid it this is a crime certainly because we know that these cancers are taking place because of certain infection and if we don't do that <coughs> avoidable death, avoidable suffering avoidable morbidity mortality and if we do cannot really do that is a crime of highest order so I, this is the reason why it was very very important to prevent cancers trying to understand the molecular basis of cancers genetic reasons uh, epigenetics and others this is one thing for which there is sizable scientific data available that this is related to hpv infection and we must stop it so uh, this is uh, the second uh, very important event in the country after the one at karachi organized by international center for chemical and biological sciences national institute of virology and comstec alliance of virology laboratories along with the uh, Virology Institute in Tupigan University, led by Professor Thomas Sifna and Jay Pago and other partners. I think we were able to contribute in our own humble way in developing understanding and appreciation of this very important field. Let me promise that we'll continue to follow it up and we'll make sure that people who matters and who can make the difference are sensitized and made aware of what are their responsibilities. But one important component of the, which is called the fourth pillar of state media. I think media has to be sensitized. And we are very, very happy and proud that uh, Mr. Murtaza Noor, a seasoned uh, science journalist is with us. Uh, I'm sure with his support, we'll be able to send this message out and media will be able to spread the news all across and uh, breadth of the country. I would like to thank you all for your presence here. I thank you all the resource persons, the wonderful people, traveled all the way, contributed their time, have, uh, you know, deliver lectures at very odd time. Australia was late in the evening and from uh, in USA, middle of the night, but they, they have done it for a mission. They all deserve our appreciation. And of course, appreciation to my team, Comstec team. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, request Dr. Iqbal Chaudhary to pre please present shields and certificates to the speaker. Professor Dr. Vaseem Jaffrey. Thank you very much, Dr. Vaseem Jaffe. Next is Dr. Fozia Asad. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, next is Professor Dr. Thomas Ifner. Thank 
Thank you very much, Dr. Efna. Uh, so with this, we come to the ending of today's session. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us and the honorable speakers for their time. Um, the participants may collect their certificates from the registration desk, please. Thank you very much. Thank you.